Hey guys, here's a compilation of stories from late December's videos through to January. When I was 16, I worked at a grocery store as a stalker. The store closed at midnight, and we would often work later than that, as it was easier to stalk the aisles without all the damn people in the way. It was around Christmas time, and unfortunately I had to work on Christmas Eve. We typically had Christmas down at my grandparents' place in rural East Texas, about an hour and a half away. And since I had work, I told my parents to go ahead without me, and I would head their way once I got off work. My grandparents lived in a gated community called Steamboat Shores, and it was lined with mobile homes, which were mostly filled with old people waiting to die. I had got my driver's license about a month and a half ago, and this would be my first somewhat long drive at night. I felt confident in the drive. It was only an hour and a half. I had been along those roads many times as a passenger, so whatever. No biggie. My mom told me to call once I had gotten off. They cut us loose around midnight. I called my mom. Hey mom, they just let us go, so I'll be getting there around 1.30 or 1.45 depending on whether I stop to get something to eat. All right, honey, I'll wait up for you. See you in a little bit. Love you. Love you too. The first 45 minutes-ish part of the drive is a fairly monotonous affair through a series of small, podunk Texas towns that no one knows the names of. It was a cold, windy night, and as I cruised through the empty streets, the wind held against my truck while I watched each Lone's Town spotlight sway back and forth in the wind. These small towns are creepier than I remember at night, I thought. I felt like a lost pack animal looking for its herd while I drove through each town. The last 45 minutes gets increasingly dark and rural. There's really not much out there, minus cows grazing in the fields and the occasional ramshackle house. This was before smartphones were ubiquitous so I had the directions written down on a piece of paper. Although, since I had been along this road many times before, I generally knew the landmarks for where I should turn. When I was roughly seven to eight minutes away, I would take a left at the grocery store called Brookshire's, and then another left about five miles at the Lake Fork Bank, and then boom, I would be at the front gate of the community. The tricky thing is that it's very easy to lose track of time along these roads, since everything looks the same, and it was already late, and my mind was wandering. I feel like I should be getting close to the Brookshires, no? I didn't pass it already, did I? I haven't been on this road that long. Well, maybe I have. Maybe I'll go another ten minutes and wait if I see it. If not, I'll drive to the next intersection and see what the crossroads are, and then call Mom. I'll ask her if I missed it. As I pull out my phone, I notice in the top left part of the screen, zero bars. Damn it. I guess I'll just pull up to the next house I see and ask them. It's so late though. But I guess it's better than nothing. Mom will be worrying soon too. After what seemed like half an hour, but was probably closer to ten minutes, I see a poorly maintained house approaching on my left side. I start easing off the gas to pull into the driveway. Ugh, really not the biggest fan of this whole situation right now, but I'm sure it's fine, so whatever. Wait, what? Is that a police car next to the house? Sweet, I'll just ask him. I'm not sure why he's just sitting next to this random house, but what does it matter? I swerve back onto the road and pull up next to the police car that's parked about 30 feet from the house. Hi, officer. I was curious if I was close to Brookshire's. I think I'm a bit lost. I was supposed to take a turn at it. Brookshire's? Yeah, it's actually about seven miles back the other way. It'll be on your right-hand side. You shouldn't miss it. Ah, oh, damn it. All right, thanks for the help, officer. Wait, wait. Hold on a second, son. I saw you swerve a little bit before you pulled into here. Have you been drinking tonight? The officer said. What? No, not at all. I just got off of work and I'm heading to my grandparents for Christmas. 
All right, son. Well, these parts are known for young idiots driving around drunker than three sheets to the wind, especially around the holidays. So I'd prefer to go ahead and run your driver's license and check your vehicle registration. No, that's fine. I understand that. I get out of my truck and hand him my information. He quickly types in my driver's license number. All right, you're good to go. Sorry about that. It's better on my part to be safe rather than sorry. You understand, kid? Yes, sir. Thanks for the help. Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas to you too, kid. I pull out of the house's front yard and I head back in the direction I came. When I'm maybe 250 to 300 feet away from the house, I look in my rearview mirror and see a pair of headlights pull out of the driveway towards me. It isn't the police car. Hmm. Maybe they had somewhere to go as well. It's probably nothing. In less than a minute, the headlights are right behind me. Uh, maybe I'm driving too slow and they want to pass. I drift my truck slightly to the right, but they don't pass. That's weird. And then boom, they blast their high beams and flood my truck with light. What the hell? This is getting really weird. After about two minutes of this, they turn their headlights completely off. The vehicle behind me appears to vanish into the night. I'm so screwed. After three to four minutes of this, they return their headlights back to normal, steadily riding my bumper. What do I do? I still don't have a phone signal. Why are they following me? I eventually see the bright neon red Berkshire sign shining like an SOS beacon. All right. Once I get closer to the store, I'm going to fishtail around the turn and put the pedal to the floor, all the way to the front gates of my parents. Wait for it. Wait for it. I fishtail around the turn so hard, cascading the vehicle behind me with rocks as I took off as fast as I could. They kept up with me the whole time. Okay, there's the bank. I'm almost there. Shit, they're still right behind me. I turn left, cross the bridge. There's the gate. I mash on the gate opener button on my truck's visor, and it starts opening as I'm about to pull up. I finally made it. I watch the gate slowly close behind me as a vehicle pulls up. It was so satisfying to hear the sound of the gate locking. Now this is where I was truly an idiot. I know for a fact that I would be the first to die if I was in a horror movie, because I was just too curious. I couldn't help myself. Who is in that jeep? Why did they follow me like that? What are they going to do now? Shoot me in the middle of all these mobile homes? In the middle of the street? Doubtful. I toss my truck in park, then get out and walk towards the gate. As I do, the window of the jeep starts rolling down. I catch a glimpse of pure white hair. What the hell? It's two grandmas in the jeep. They had a shotgun between them. Hey there, Sonny. We didn't mean to scare you. What's y'all's problem? You could have caused an accident. No, no. We didn't mean to do that. We just thought you might have been a snitch. We wanted to see who you was. Snitch? Yeah, one of our in-laws just got out of the clink. We thought you might be after him. So apparently one of these old ladies' relatives had just gotten out of prison. They said this person had gotten a better deal by writing out some people, but they didn't say what the crime was, nor did I press the conversation. That's why there was a police car next to their house. I asked them why they turned their headlights on. Well, they had night vision goggles and were trying to see if I was a man or a woman. What the fuck? I eventually made it to my grandparents' place. My mother still awake. Why are you so late? What took so long? I was being hunted by grandma's mom, but they couldn't catch me. Needless to say, she was not a fan of the story and she was very upset that I approached the car after I was safe inside the gate. Sorry, Mom. 
I'm just too damn curious. So when I was in high school, I wasn't a very hardworking student. I wasn't a troublemaker, but I was an incredibly lazy girl, working just the minimum so my parents wouldn't get angry. I've always had some kind of easiness regarding schoolwork, and never knew what it truly meant to make any effort, so I spent all my class drawing on my copybooks without many consequences. My junior year's math teacher was pretty upset about this. He wanted me to work harder. I wasn't bad at maths. I was around 13 to 14 over 20, but sometimes my grades would be very low. During a teacher-parent meeting, he told my mom that I was wasting my capacities, that it was infuriating how lazy I was. My mom then replied that she agreed with him and that she wouldn't blame him for pushing me harder and for punishing me if it wasn't making me work harder. And from this day on, he did exactly what she said. In every math class, he would always question me first before everyone else. He was always sitting next to me when we were doing exercises. During the test, he was always telling me, You can do it, Elisa. It made me feel incredibly uncomfortable, because at this age, no one wants to be the attention's focus. My classmates started to realize that my math teacher was a little too obsessed by me, and they were teasing me a lot about this. The last class before Christmas break, the maths teacher threw a little surprise Christmas party. It was very nice. He gave us chocolates and mock champagne. We had a lot of fun. During the party, he poured me another glass of mock champagne, telling me that I deserved it because I was doing better. I accepted it, but didn't drink it entirely, seeing as I have diabetes and already had too much chocolate. But during the next class, I was feeling very bad. I almost fainted and finished my last day of school before Christmas in the nurse's office. At that time, I wouldn't even think it was because of the alcohol-free champagne. I thought it was due to my diabetes, that I indeed had too much chocolate, even if it didn't look like my usual crisis. A few weeks later, my class threw some kind of charity event. It was a class project and we were very proud. In my country, we don't have proms, so it was our occasion to wear pretty formal clothes and dance together. The math teacher was invited, and he was helping some of the boys tend to the bar. He served me an alcohol-free cocktail, but before I could drink it, a classmate of mine, Flora, poured some vodka in it, even though it was forbidden to bring alcohol at the event. I was mad because with my diabetes, I couldn't drink alcohol. I told her that she could just throw the cocktail. At the time I thought she did, but now when I think about it, I wonder if she chose to drink it instead. The event ended pretty badly because of the alcohol Flora bought in. Some guys were very drunk. They started breaking things and getting rambunctious, and Flora passed out because of all the alcohol she had. This ended the event. Flora had been admitted to the hospital because her coma was pretty severe, and we spent the next day being lectured by all the teachers of the school. Flora got expelled from the school, and she never went there again. I was very upset with her, so I kind of ghosted her. I never asked if she was doing better. Now I do feel bad about this, but at the time I was immature. But because of that, I will never know if she was ill because of the alcohol, or because of my cocktail. A few weeks later, I failed a maths test. It had been a long time since I failed a math test, and my math teacher was very angry. He yelled at me in front of everyone, saying how much of a disappointment I was, that I was hopeless, that I would just end up living in a cardboard box under a bridge. Something was off, and I was feeling it. He had a very weird look in his eyes. It chilled me, and I couldn't help it, but I started crying. He calmed down a bit and said he would just give me an hour of detention, during which I will redo my lesson. I was a little surprised because normally, detention is for bad behavior, not bad grades, but I was a little relieved because it was a small punishment. My parents would never know. 
Indeed, I lived kind of far from my high school, and there was only one bus every night between my high school and my home, at 5 p.m. Because of that, even when I finished at 4 p.m., I would never get home before 5, and when I had detention between 4 to 5 p.m., my parents would never know because I'd be back at the same time. But then, when he officially gave me the hour detention, he said that he wanted to be personally present during my detention, and that the only possible hour for it was during 5 to 6. I was really nervous, because I would have to tell my parents to come get me at 6, and then they would know everything. As I said earlier, I was not a troublemaker, so at first I planned to go to the detention hour. But during the day, my friends and I talked a lot about it and I was feeling more rebellious. So I decided not to tell my parents that I was in detention and have one of my friends pick me up at 6 p.m. and drive me home. At 5 p.m., when I was heading towards the detention room, I was angry, mumbling that it wasn't fair to be in detention because of my one and only bad grade. When I arrived at the detention room, I realized I was the only one waiting. I then realized that I would be the only student in detention all alone with that math teacher who was a little obsessive, and it was getting dark outside. It was a big no for me, and when I saw him coming, I panicked. And I said something like, Sorry, I have an emergency. I have to get going now. I will email the school for rescheduling my detention hour. And then I ran off. He started to yell at me that I had to obey him and go to detention, that he would call my parents. At this moment, I didn't care. I sprinted towards the bus stop and caught my bus, and I went home. I was so afraid that it would have called my parents, so when I arrived home, I was shaking. But my parents greeted me normally, so I assumed that he didn't call them. He never came back the next day, nor the following weeks. I eventually learned that he quit his position. A shrink came in for an hour, to ask us if we wanted to talk about the math teacher, but as nobody knew what was going on with him, we didn't have much to say, and the shrink left, and we never heard from him again. That is, until a few months ago. I became a teacher, and one day, chatting with my co-worker, I mentioned his name, talking about the weird, bizarre math teacher, and how I skipped a detention hour, and one of my oldest co-workers went very pale hearing his name. In fact, a few days after the detention hour incident, my math teacher was arrested for having snuff movies on his computer, all downloaded from the dark web. Maybe this detention hour was just a detention hour, and I would have gotten out of it without any problem, but now I will never know, and I will always wonder what would have happened if I stayed, or if I didn't catch my bus. This was in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas. I was heading to Oklahoma from the East Coast to visit family for Christmas. I was too cheap to pay for a hotel, so I got off of the I-40, parked behind a hotel, and slept in my Jeep. In the middle of the night, I get woken up by the sound of a small scraping noise. Confused, I open my eyes to see a figure outside, attempting to work the zipper on my soft top. Horrified, I simply sat there. It wasn't until they managed to stick their hand through the small opening they had created that I reached out, grabbed the nearest thing to me, and smashed their hand with it. Without wanting to see the result of this, I jumped into the front seat, worked the ignition, and peeled out of that hotel parking lot faster than I've ever left anywhere. I didn't stop for gas, red lights, breakfast, or anything. I merged straight onto the I-40 and continued west for almost 30 miles. Needless to say, that was the last time I ever slept in my Jeep. This was after a Christmas Eve party, when everyone went home. I decided to stay, because my cousin and I were watching a movie. My uncle who used to walk his dogs in the woods next to a park, 
went off and took them out. Before he went out, my aunt told him not to do that because it was too dark out there. But he didn't care much, and he went anyway. My aunt was quite worried, so I went along with him. And once there, nothing wrong seemed to happen. Everything was quiet. My uncle and his dogs were having a relaxing walk as usual, and I wasn't paying attention to the surroundings when suddenly, the dogs went still. This wasn't that strange. They always stopped to stare and bark at other animals. Anything they noticed, like birds, rats, insects, or other dogs. However, this time was different. When the dogs became still, my uncle and I noticed something was wrong. The dogs weren't angry or curious. They were kind of nervous, anxious, and afraid. One of the dogs, the biggest one, was growling and shaking. As my uncle started to get worried about the situation, we heard it. People in the woods. We couldn't see how many because of the darkness, but they were saying something. What we managed to hear was, we all gather here, by the blood up and we couldn't catch whatever they said after that. After my uncle and I heard that, he yelled for his dogs to follow him out of the woods. As we all left, he turned his head back, and he saw the slight movement of branches and shrubs, perhaps because these people were trying to hide. After all that happened, he hasn't walked his dogs near those woods when it got dark again. For a bit of background, my dad frequently travels for his job and has accumulated a lot of miles through Delta. Both he and my mom bought me a ticket with miles as an early Christmas present from Oregon to Montana so I could spend time with my boyfriend during his finals weeks, since my finals weeks were finished a week before his. Luckily, we drove back to Oregon together for his winter break, so I didn't have to deal with the hassle of flying back. This was my first flight completely alone, and the only occasion I will fly out to see my boyfriend, because he always drives back home during his school breaks. I had a 2.5 hour layover in Salt Lake City, Utah, before I would fly out to Montana. During that time, I kept myself occupied by sitting alone, somewhat close to where my gate was, and charging my phone while browsing Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. I was sitting at a table up against the wall where you could look out the window and see airplanes that were parked or getting ready to taxi. There were tables lined up all against this wall, and they were mostly filled with one or two people. There were also large decorative plants between every couple of tables. As I was sitting there, this man approached me. Probably in his mid-twenties, he wasn't very tall. He had a long dark coat on, only carried a backpack and there was something very off about his demeanor. I didn't notice until I looked him in the eyes and saw that they weren't aligned. Knowing how people can't help the way they look, I was friendly when he said hello and introduced himself. He held out two of his fingers so I could shake them, which was already odd. He sat down at one of the chairs facing me and put his backpack on the ground against the chair leg. He kept pointing at the planes and muttering numbers under his breath either about the model they were, or God knows what. His voice was slurred and difficult to understand. I smiled politely and pretended to be interested, and then resumed scrolling through my phone. He then told me I was beautiful and asked if I had a boyfriend. I said yes, and then he asked if we lived together. I said no. I told him I was on my way to see him. The guy asked where my boyfriend is and I tell him he's in Montana for school. Never once did I tell this guy where I was from. He asked me if we were doing long distance and I said yes, knowing it's only temporary until my boyfriend graduates in May. The guy then proceeds to tell me that I'm wasting my time and money doing long distance, and even goes as far to say that we will break up. This made me angry because this guy knew nothing about our situation and had no business telling me anything about my relationship. I looked him in the eye and told him to leave. He asked why. I told him I didn't want him there. 
He kept trying to say stuff about my relationship, and I kept firmly asking him to leave, getting to the point where I was panicking and yelling. People walking by were just starting to look over at us, which made me even more nervous because I don't like to draw attention to myself in public. The guy finally picked up his bag and told me he would leave, as well as he doesn't know why I'm mad. He reached his two fingers out so I could shake them goodbye. I screamed at him, don't touch me. He told me I'm being stupid as he stood up, and the last thing he said before he walked away was, Good luck on the breakup. I told him to shut up, and he said something I don't remember as he walked away. I immediately called my boyfriend crying. I told him what happened, and then called my mom. My mom said I should have gotten up and walked away, and if he followed me, I could have gotten security. In the moment, it's hard to remember your options. Later on, as I walked to my gate, I saw him talking to another girl sitting by herself and introducing himself in the same odd way. I have no idea why he was doing this in an airport. I don't want to assume any mental problems this guy would have had or if he was under the influence of something, but this terrified me. My boyfriend and I are still happy together, so suck it, creepy airport guy. I met Lucy for the first time when she fell asleep on my arm on the bus. When she woke up, she gave me a really weird look before shambling off the bus. I figured she was weirded out that I didn't wake her up sooner, so I kicked myself for being a creep and went on with my day. Can't win them all. I was thrown for a hell of a loop when her whole friend group was sitting by my usual spot on the bus the next day. Being an awkward teen. I wasn't about to turn down any kind of positive attention. I got to know her friends and ended up on good terms with her before I realized I hadn't asked her name. I'm hard of hearing, so I didn't hear when she said her name. Lucy, right? Yeah. Lucy and I had your typical high school courting process. That is to say, she was overwhelmingly forward, and after a few weeks, I got the hint. As we were getting closer, Lucy would fixate on learning about past heartbreak and finding out about my personal life. I am a serial oversharer, so I didn't really mind talking about myself, but she would constantly butt in saying how messed up things were and that she'd kick my friend's ass for hurting me. I was weirded out. Even at 16, I knew that was cringy, and I was going through my emo phase. The thing that really bugged me at the time was that she'd ask so much about me, but she would never say anything about herself. It made me feel shitty, always venting and never helping her out. During this time, she missed a few days, and I let another girl sit by me since it was an overcrowded bus, and I didn't think it mattered. When Lucy came back and saw me with another girl, you'd think she was shot. She just about ran to the seat behind us and started going off. I can't remember exactly what Lucy said, but the other girl never talked to me again after that. Once her arrival was gone, Lucy reclaimed her spot next to me and was all sunshine and rainbows. Nobody ever asked to sit in Lucy's spot after that. Lucy always had a crude sense of humor, but after a while, things started getting hurtful. She would take jabs at my insecurities, and any time I got upset about it, she would give me shit about not being able to take a joke. These jokes usually stopped just shy of outright insulting me. When Lucy wasn't breaking me down, she was super affectionate. She would sleep on my chest while we rode home on the bus, and she'd even talk about herself from time to time. I don't remember the first time she hit me. It seems like something that would be burned into my memory, some kind of cinematic moment in my life. Honestly, it was just all blended together after a while. I know it started off small though, flicking me and playfully slapping. By the end of it, she would elbow me in the ribs for telling a bad joke. It didn't register as anything abusive until she slammed me into a wall while we were walking through the hallway after class. I told a shitty joke and she shoved me hard into the wall. 
She left because of the sound it made before shoving me again. People were going through the halls with us, but they didn't do anything. Sometimes I wonder what they thought of me. I didn't dump her after the hallway incident, but I did start standing up for myself. We started getting into a lot of fights after that. Of course, they only ever ended in one of two ways. She was right, or it was an honest mistake. I tried to break things off a few times around that time, but every time I did, she had a new sob story I hadn't heard before that made her actions totally understandable. I let it get into my head that she was some tragic soul and that I could help her. I convinced myself that there was something noble about taking the abuse, and nobody I knew tried to step in and stop me. I finally got the nerve to dump her after three major things happened within a three-week span. First, I found out she was taking photos of me while I wasn't looking, and then posting them online. The weird thing was that I only found out because she showed me. I felt gross seeing a bunch of nearly identical pictures of me not facing the camera. The way she showed me was worse. She seemed excited like I'd be happy she invaded my privacy. The second weird thing happened when I tried to wake her on the bus. About half an hour on my chest, not saying anything, I nudged her shoulder since we were at our stop. She just got up, looked me in the eye, and told me she wasn't asleep. Combined with the pictures, this seemed really weird to me. She didn't try to be cute or romantic about it, or like she pretends to sleep on me sometimes. What the hell? The breaking point came when she was showing off some award she got from school. There was something off about the award. It didn't have her name on it. Oh no, it had a name. It even had a picture of her smiling on it. The problem is, it wasn't addressed to Lucy. You can't imagine what I felt when I found out I didn't even know my girlfriend's name. A few days later, we got into one of our usual fights, and I broke things off. Lucy always was the persistent type. She would sit a few rows behind me on the bus and stare at me while I went to my car after getting off the bus. Looking at her wouldn't make her stop. It felt like she wanted me to know she was watching me. One day when she got off the bus, she looked me right in the eyes for a solid 20 seconds while she walked past me, to her new seat. I'm pretty sure she was expecting me to say something to her. The next year I graduated and got a retail job. End of the story, right? I thought so, too. It was the start of Christmas season, and I was working cashier that night. Lucy came into the store I was working at. Random chance. It had been a year and a half since we broke up at this point, so I wasn't happy to see her, but surely we could pretend it wasn't weird. She gave me the look the squirrel in Ice Age gives his nut. She grabbed something from the front and went straight into my line. She didn't say a word to me, but she wouldn't break eye contact, and she was swaying like an excited toddler. It hurt to look at her. I rang her up silently and waited for her to leave. I looked at the other cashier for support, and he told me she was giving weird vibes. I got this really bad feeling in my gut after she left. Lucy became a regular at our small shop. She would come in and creep out my co-workers. Lucy never really tried to hide what she was doing. One of the cashiers mentioned how often she came while ringing her out, and she said she was visiting me. She didn't say my name, but she described me. After that, whenever she showed up, someone would make a note of it on the radio. She was usually in one of the areas bordering my workspace. I heard about her a lot more than I saw her, so I think she was hiding from me. She never got banned from the store despite complaints because the managers were penny-pinching assholes who would sell any one of us out to get sales up. I know Lucy was responsible for at least one resignation from my workplace. Someone who looked like me caught her staring a few times and heard how often she came. After a while, the stress just wasn't worth the minimum wage. The last time I saw Lucy at the store was a little over a year ago now. I was hanging out with one of the girls in the back while we were loading up carts with stuff we had to stock. We were right by the back entrance, so you could see right in from the store. I left to put the stuff in my cart, and when I came back, 
She was standing about 40 feet from the back entrance, still as a statue. I froze when I saw her. I watched her stare into the back for what felt like hours, before she suddenly turned and walked briskly away. The girl I was talking to was still in the back when I returned. She was a lot more awkward after that. The girl quit three days later and just about crushed my ribs when she hugged me goodbye. She hated her job, so I'd like to think it didn't have anything to do with Lucy, but I don't know. I left the store not too long after that and got a job that didn't involve customer service. That wasn't the last time I saw her, though. Over the summer, after taking my new job, I had a mental breakdown. I convinced myself that I was unlovable and that Lucy was the only person I could possibly be with. I left the house without any conceivable plan to find her. With stars in the sky, lit by street lamps, I saw her. She was with another girl, I got so close I could almost touch her before I snapped to my senses. I thought about her stalking me at the store, and I realized I was becoming her. I ran home. I cried that night. The last time I saw Lucy was last week. I was walking home from work and decided to stop for dinner. I thought I saw her in line, but convinced myself it was someone else. I ordered and sat down to eat. I was looking out the window while I ate, and she took the table between me and the window I was looking out of. She was with some guy that looked vaguely familiar, maybe a school friend. The way she was sat was at an angle, so she was half looking at him, and every few seconds she would look at me. I know it was her now. She changed her hair. It looks an awful like mine now. After I finished, I went to the bathroom because I felt sick. After washing my hands, I looked into the mirror, and I felt like I could die. It hadn't occurred to me before, but I was wearing my work uniform, complete with company name on my hat in big letters. She was reading my hat. Lucy hasn't been to my current job yet, but I'm sure she'll turn up eventually. I'm moving soon, so I'm just hoping I'm not here anymore when Lucy turns up. Lucy has been a part of my life for the last four years. We dated for four months in high school and she keeps turning up. I wasn't a paragon of mental health before I met her, but I feel like she broke me as a person and I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. Since her abuse and her stalking, I've developed serious trust issues. I get painfully nervous when I'm leaving my house and people who show interest in me immediately put me on edge. I've tried to date since everything happened, but I just can't. I'm too much work at this point, so I've decided that I'll stay single until I can work through my issues. I work at a popular retail store in a mall close to my on-campus apartment. I was home for Christmas break and decided to work Christmas Eve since I was promised time and a half and I could use the money to buy some extra Christmas presents. My childhood home is not very far from my apartment, but it is about an hour drive from my work to my childhood home. Our holiday hours were extended this year, and I was given a closing shift for Christmas Eve. The store closed at 10pm, and the closing shift ended at 10.30, meaning that I would be getting home around midnight after swinging through a drive through to grab something to eat. The closing shift at the store usually had two employees and a manager working, but the other employee that was supposed to close with me was out sick, so it was just me and the manager. While the manager emptied and counted the cash drawers and wrote the daily report, I gathered up all the trash and cardboard and left it all by the back door in the stock room. I dusted and vacuumed until the manager was finished with the daily report, and then he put in the combination to disable the alarm and he held open the back door for me to take out the trash and cardboard. This part was usually the most helpful to have two employees instead of one, because the dumpster was walled off and the manager had to wait by the door to make sure no one walked into the store. But the dumpster wasn't too far away, and I wanted to get home as soon as possible, so I carried all the trash. Our store shared the dumpster with only three other stores, so I wasn't expecting to see anybody by the dumpster. 
I was so startled that I dropped my bags when I saw someone digging through the trash. He looked up at me when he heard the bags fall. Oh, hi. I dropped my wallet in the trash. Can you help me grab it? He asked. A thousand red flags went off in my brain, and I immediately began to back away. Uh, I don't think I can. I need to take out the trash and get back to my store, I said, trying to walk towards the store slowly. Which store do you work at? He asked. I'm not sure why I told him, but I told him the store I worked at, and he nodded. Oh, nice store. You can just leave the bags here. I'll toss them when I'm done looking. I went back into the store at that point, a little creeped out but not suspecting anything else. I told my boss what happened and he laughed a bit. He offered to walk me to my car as I was parked in the lot behind the store and he was parked in the garage attached to the main mall. I declined and walked to the nearly empty parking lot. There were only three cars in the parking lot, including mine. One car was parked close to the back entrance of a neighboring restaurant and the other car was parked just a few spots away from mine. I couldn't see the person inside, but the car was on, and it looked like the person was trying to warm up the car from the inside before scraping off the ice on the windshield. I glanced at the car a few times just to mentally jot down the make and model of the car, a blue Honda Accord. I then got into my vehicle and locked the doors. I called my parents to let them know I was leaving now, and that I would be stopping by to grab dinner on the way home, so not to wait up. I kept my eyes peeled for different fast food joints on the side of the highway, but the majority of them were closed as it was 11pm on Christmas Eve. I was getting hungrier and hungrier as I got closer and closer to the exit from my house. I had decided to just scrounge up some leftovers at home as I drove through my town when I saw a subway with blinking lights that said, Open Late. I peeled into the parking lot of the subway and saw the red light sign indicating that it was open. I walked into the sandwich shop and took a look around, as it looked pretty empty. I called out to an empty store, and was able to get the attention of the only person working in the store. I thought I locked that door. We just closed, the worker said. Come on, man. I just got off of work and I want to grab something to eat before I go to bed. I'll be real quick, I promise. I begged him. He sighed and agreed, probably taking pity on how exhausted I looked. We talked for a little bit about working the late shift on Christmas Eve as he made my sandwich, before a group of teenage boys walked into the store. We're closed, guys. I'm gonna lock the store after I'm done making her a sandwich, he said. But I want a sandwich, one of the boys whined. Fine. The subway employee got out from behind the counter and locked the door so no one else would be able to get in, and he could ensure the teenagers would be his last customers of the night. He finished making my sandwich and left me to pick out my drink and chips at the soda fountain. Most of the boys only bought bags of chips or cookies, so they were all finished before I finished filling up my soda, and the subway employee disappeared into the back. I put my lid on my cup and was looking for a straw when something caught my eye. The man from the dumpster was waiting in the parking lot, next to my car. He was sitting on the hood of the car that was parked next to mine. It was the blue Honda Accord. I really started to freak out at that point. There was no reason for this guy to be in my town an hour away from the mall, at the exact place I decided to stop if he wasn't following me. And what was he doing on the hood of his car? It was the day before Christmas. It was snowing and below 30 degrees. Hey, uh, can you guys walk me to my car? I asked the group of boys. Yeah, you alright? One of the boys asked. Oh, I'm fine. I just don't want to slip on any ice, I lied. I felt a bit silly, because there was probably a perfectly good reason for the man from the dumpster to be in the parking lot. Something that didn't have to do with me, but I was still nervous. The boys walked me to my car and waited until I drove off. The man didn't even look at me as I got into my car. I had about 10 minutes until I got to my house, and I tried to shake the weird feeling I got about the man in the dumpster. It took me a while to notice, but I realized that there was someone following me. 
It was hard to see because the car's lights were off, but I noticed the car when I glanced in my rearview mirror as I drove under a street lamp. I started to get nervous again and drove past my house. I turned back onto the main road, hoping I would lose this guy. This car stayed on my tail, and I watched in my rearview mirror as we went under a streetlight again. It was a blue Honda Accord. I pulled out my phone and called 911. I explained the situation to the dispatcher. The dispatcher advised me to drive to the nearest police station and told me she would inform the station of what was going on. I stayed on the line with the dispatcher until I pulled into the police station. The Honda Accord drove past the station. There was a police car waiting outside the station that drove after the guy. But ultimately, there was nothing they could do besides give him a ticket for driving with his lights off. My description of the man by the dumpster matched the driver of the Accord. I don't know what he had planned, but I haven't seen him since and told my boss about the incident. So I won't have to take the trash out on my own anymore. It was evening on Christmas Day, around 2012. I'm around 16 or 17, and my mom and I are driving back home after spending Christmas Day with our extended family in Greater London. My mom and I lived with our dog Pika. We were just chatting away about Christmas, then the conversation moved to Santa Claus. And then we started talking about other mythical holiday characters, such as the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. We talked for a while about how when I was young, my mom used to keep my baby teeth in a small jar with a blue fairy on top of it. And I always remembered this jar from my childhood, but I hadn't seen it for many years. I remembered the last time I had seen it. It was partly wrapped in black duct tape, and if I had to estimate when this was, I would say several years before, probably around the time when we were moving house and were packing up. So about five years prior in 2007, we spoke for a while about baby teeth and this jar. My mom also stating that she hadn't seen it in a long time and hoped it wasn't lost during the process of the house move. I even remember saying that I thought it was a bit gross that she kept all my baby teeth in the first place and that they are just sitting in the house somewhere. Anyway, this conversation went on for a while and then we moved on to talking about something else. We arrived home shortly after walked in the front door and greeted my dog as usual. My mom walks into the kitchen and I follow immediately behind her. And there, on the floor of the kitchen, is the small jaw, opened in two pieces, and all these tiny baby teeth all over the floor. My first reaction was to think my mom was trying to spook me, but then I looked and saw her face, and I realized she definitely wasn't. She immediately freaks out and starts ringing everyone she knows to tell them what's happened. My dog Pika was pretty old at that point, and she was very docile when we'd leave the house. She would never go rummaging around through belongings or anything like that. It wouldn't really be possible anyway, as most stuff is kept in drawers and cupboards that she couldn't access. Weird, right? I still don't have an explanation for it. My mom has a fair few unexplainable stories about things that have happened to her before I was born, and although I knew she was never lying to me, I was always a little bit skeptical about the circumstances. I thought maybe she missed something which could logically explain her experiences. Then, when this happened, I thought, oh shit, maybe she's right, because I can't explain this one. At the beginning of my freshman year in high school, my mom was diagnosed with late-stage ovarian cancer. It was a huge blow for my family, and especially me, since my dad wasn't around for most of my childhood, and she was the only parent I had. It all happened about three months after my mom was diagnosed. My school was organizing a bunch of Catholic retreats for upcoming Christmas. The retreats would mainly consist of meeting with missionaries telling about their journeys and people from our school attending masses together. My relationship with God and faith was mostly on and off for the majority of my life. 
I come from a devoted Christian family, but I lean more to the agnostic view of the world. I didn't really care for the retreats, but I signed up for them anyways, so I didn't upset my mom who was already an emotional wreck. On the first day I attended, I decided I would go to the missionary meeting, but I would skip the mass with the rest of the people in my group. After leaving the school and heading down the road to the nearest bus stop, I saw a homeless man asking for money. I have severe social anxiety, and I hate dealing with these types of situations. So deep down, I prayed that someone would give him money and the guy wouldn't bother me. But unfortunately nobody gave him anything and he walked up to me. He looked fairly normal. He had a long grey beard and was wearing a puffy black coat. A rosary was wrapped around his right hand. He introduced himself as Marius. He told me that he was recently released from prison and he needs a bit of money. I am not the type of guy who thinks that every homeless person wants to use the money given to them for alcohol and drugs, and I don't judge them based on appearance either. So I started to look for some change in my wallet. While I was searching for money, Marius expressed his gratitude and also repeated the story about being released from jail, and then out of the blue he said he can see ghosts. I didn't pay much attention to it, thinking that he is probably mentally ill. After giving him money, he thanked me for it and extended his hand for a handshake. I shook his hand, and then instantaneously he put his other hand on mine. He said something to the extent of, I know your mother is very sick. Go to the church and pray. God will surely help you. After hearing that, I was completely dumbfounded. I didn't go to the church, but went straight to the bus stop. After that happening, I saw him maybe twice, and every time I did, I had the intense feeling that he was looking straight at me. After those events, I never saw him again out of the two and a half years of high school. I've never told this story to anybody, not even my mom. I hate myself for it because she passed away more than 15 months ago in a hospice. And maybe if she knew about it, she might have accepted her death much easier. In 2018, the Saturday before Christmas, I was out on a birthday bar crawl in the Lower East Side. We were all getting a bit bored with the crowd and decided to go back to one of our friend's apartments to take a breather, listen to music, and decide what to move on to next. Cut to me realizing I had 10 missed calls from various members of my family. My uncle had been rushed to the hospital and didn't make it. My uncle was the youngest of my mom's siblings, and was more like an older teenage brother to me than an uncle. We grew up together in a very close family. I don't think I realized how quickly grief hits you when you get news like that. The sound of my father's voice crackling and straining to get the words out, he didn't make it, out of his mouth, was more than I could handle. I crumbled into a pile of tears right in the middle of the kitchen. In a daze, I made my way back up to Harlem, trying to pull myself together and to figure out what to do. I couldn't get anyone in the city on the phone. I couldn't get myself to call anyone in my family, so I needed to suck it up and get home that night. Mission accomplished. Flight changed. Bags packed with the help of my neighbor and a couple of clonopin to help me get the hell home. All of this to get to the point of this story. I'm barely able to keep myself together as I wait on the subway platform. The change of ticket and my lack of savings just wouldn't allow for a taxi ride to the airport. Just as I feel like I'm about to completely break down, I noticed a man in a light-colored, absolutely beautiful suit. He had blonde bobbing curls on top and shortly bossed on the side. I turned to take a bit more notice, and then I saw his face. Strange to say, but I can't recall anything about it now. It's a blank space in a very detailed memory. The only thing I can remember about his appearance was that it absolutely took my breath away. It wasn't an, oh my god, this man is so sexy kind of way. It was sheer admiration for the absolutely perfect and symmetrical face. 
So here we are, the only two people waiting at this stop on 145th. The man seems to be almost giddy with joy, as if he was seeing the world for the very first time. It wasn't a crazed forced happiness. He seemed as genuine as a child in Disney World seeing the Magic Kingdom for the first time. When we boarded the subway, he sat mirror to me. I was in a far left seat, and he was on the opposite side of the train to the right. It was quite crowded, but I looked up at some point before the 125th stop to see that he was staring directly at me. It wasn't scary. It was as if he was waiting for me to finally notice him. All he did was look me in the eyes, nod his head in confirmation, and then wink at me. It gives me chills to remember it. The comfort that washed over me felt like a warm embrace. I felt the security of a child who would scrape their knee. That feeling of mom making it all better. I was able to get myself home, head held high, and without the help of the clonopin. I'm not a religious person. I have scuffed about God, and I felt resentful when anyone brings up their beliefs. I don't know how to explain it, but I have this deep feeling that I saw an angel that day, all alone and navigating through intense emotions. I truly feel this man was sent to give me the comfort and strength to get home. It almost feels embarrassing to say that, but I have no other explanation. On Christmas Day, my great-grandmother was hospitalized due to an infection caused by her kidney dialysis. She went downhill from there and passed away the morning of January 16th. To start this whole thing off, my grandfather had loaded a bunch of Johnny Reed onto his iPod for her to listen to while she was at the hospital. He did so and brought the iPod home the night before she passed away to charge it. He was woken up at 7am to his iPod playing Dance With Me. That was her favorite song. They went to the hospital, and she passed away two hours later. Christmas Eve, we had a family gathering, with all of her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. There are four great-grandchildren. She has contacted three of us. The first was my little cousin, who we'll call Barry. Barry has had night terrors and runs into his parents' room crying, and two nights after my great-grandmother passed away, Barry walked into his parents' room and asked them, What does see ya mean? They explained and asked why, and he responded with, Grammy came to visit me and said see ya. The second was my other little cousin who lives on the other side of Canada. We'll call her Madison. She wasn't yet told about her great-grandmother passing away, but she had been telling her mother and father about a rainbow angel she had been playing with. She does not scare her, but calms her. The third was me, a few days ago. It was during the funeral. I was sitting in the front row about ten minutes before it was about to start. As clear as day, in my right ear I hear her say, Bye, honey, like she would always say to me when I was leaving her house. It was clear enough that it made me turn and look. It is personally relieving that she isn't going through dialysis treatments anymore as it caused her more suffering than anything else, but I will miss her more than anything. These events have just come as a surprise to me, because very few members of my family believe in paranormal things, and I just thought I would share this story. This happened when I was four years old, and it's probably the most vivid memory from around that time. I've also never shared this story with anyone apart from my mother. It was Christmas morning 2004. Our house was being renovated to make room for my new baby brother, so we'd been staying with my grandparents on my mom's side who lived next door. I was sleeping in one of the bedrooms with my mom, dad, and my new brother. I mention this because as a child I was terrified of being alone and the dark scared me more than anything else. It was so bad I would demand as many nightlights as possible to be put in my room while I slept. 
I absolutely refused to sleep alone. The fear of the boogeyman or encountering something supernatural was real back then, and I always thought if either of those things were to happen to me, it would be while I was alone, in the dark, or both. I woke up that morning to find I was completely alone in the room I had been sleeping in. My mom, dad, and brother had all gotten up earlier without waking me. Once I realized I was alone, my immediate thought was to run out of the room and be in the living room before something got to me, but I hesitated. Before I could spring out of bed, I noticed a sound that I would describe as somewhere between humming and singing. Think Pink Floyd's The Great Gig in the Sky, or something off of a Dark Souls soundtrack. I'm sure there's a name for it, but I don't know the word. The voice was feminine and she wasn't speaking any words. Well, at least not words I could understand. She carried on singing for a while, and despite being in an environment that would normally fill me with extreme discomfort, I stayed and listened. It put me at peace in a way. I didn't really feel the need to be worried or afraid. I looked around the room, but was unable to find the source of the singing. It sounded like there was no definite source, and it was all around me, or maybe directly overhead. After a few minutes of listening to the singing, I built the courage to get up and walk into the living room where my family was, and as soon as I left the room, I was no longer able to hear the singing. I immediately found my mother and asked if someone had been singing, or if the radio had been on, but she said that nobody had been singing and that the radio in my grandparents' living room didn't work. I think I was trying to rationalize it as something that made sense to me even though I was absolutely sure that the sound was coming from inside the room. Upon revisiting the room, I heard nothing, and this experience never happened again. I've brought it up to my mother on a few occasions, and she stands by her story as much as I stand by mine. I've experienced sleep paralysis once or twice, and this wasn't it. I was able to move and could have left at any time. I have also never experienced any audio or visual hallucinations. I like to believe that an ancestor, or perhaps another friendly spirit that was passing by, saw how panicked I was at waking up alone in the dark, and decided to try and comfort me. But I guess I'll probably never know for sure. When I was eight or nine, I saw something weird on Christmas Eve. This was many, many years ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I still believed in Santa Claus back then, as a good amount of children do. I had the usual anxiety and excitement for Santa to leave Christmas presents by the tree. After I went to bed, I had some trouble going to sleep with my holiday nerves and such. I had finally drifted off when I woke up to the sound of soft footsteps somewhere in my room. I automatically assumed it was Santa Claus, and I was scared to see him for fear he might leave or his magic will fail. I opened one eye just barely and saw this black figure standing over my bed, staring at me. It was tall, probably around six feet tall, and it was completely dark. It almost looked blacker than black in a way, I couldn't see any eyes, a mouth, or a nose on it, but I clearly saw the outline of a head, arms, body, and legs. It looked like a bigger person, so thinking it was Santa just made sense. It stayed in one spot for maybe 10 or 15 seconds, until it took a few steps closer. It leaned in a little more, still a few feet away from me, and then stayed there for another 10 to 15 seconds more. Even though I couldn't see a face, I knew it was looking right at me. It's just that weird feeling you get when you know you're being watched or looked at. I closed my eyes again and waited for a few minutes. When I looked back, it was gone. I lived in a pretty old house at the time, so the doors and floorboards were squeaky and loud. I heard the footsteps, but I never heard the door open. I never saw this figure again though I have had some other experiences in this house. I asked my mom if she heard Santa when he came into my room last night. She looked confused for a second, 
Then she played along and just assumed I was lying. I know this wasn't a person, and I know this wasn't a dream. I also know that spirits and entities are often attracted to lots of excitement and energy. So Christmas would be a perfect time for a ghost to pass through. For a bit of backstory, shortly after my husband and I got married in 2019, we went up to northern Washington State to visit his family for Christmas and New Year's. Spending most of my life in Florida, I was pumped to see the snow there. To get the best snow, his dad and stepmom brought us up to Ladder Falls, a pretty long drive up the mountains away from any sort of civilization in the middle of winter. When I say there was no one there, I mean it. We ran into one woman who I guess enjoyed the spot to take her dog on a walk. And that was it. Anyway, after spending a good couple of hours exploring the trails, we finally made it to the waterfalls there. It was so beautiful, especially with the snowy landscape, and it was so thunderously loud I had to take a video. You can hear my husband and I talking about some of the workers' paths that go up to the side of the waterfall. Apparently during the summer, they have a sort of light show in the waterfall, where I believe music is played as well. However, when we were there, all this wasn't being put on, because again, hardly anyone would even see it. The only thing we could hear was the waterfall itself. Fast forward to the next day, I'm looking at all the pictures I'd gotten on my phone and got to the video. I started watching it and was surprised at what I was hearing. My husband was getting dressed and asked where the music was from, and if I was adding music into the video. I told him I didn't even know how to do that. I said no, and we listened together. I submitted this video to a paranormal YouTube channel who said they didn't really have an explanation for it. In the comments, people pointed out that you could only hear music in one side of the headphones, which I listened to again and found out they were right. I don't know what would cause that either. Every single person I've shown this to were lost for any sort of reasoning, but the music is really pretty regardless. My family and I have been dealing with what seems to be poltergeist activity in the home we're renting. Occasionally we will see figures, hear voices, and that kind of thing. What intrigues me the most is sometimes the strange things that will occur, such as me walking into my kitchen to find every cabinet is wide open, as well as everything plugged into an outlet is unplugged. December 1st comes around, and I take the Christmas tree out of storage and begin assembling it. But I haven't added the ornaments yet. At that time, I was very tired due to lack of sleep so I decided to take a nap. After waking up, I walk out into the living room, and I realize that there is one ornament hung in the center of my tray. I got chills because my parents are on a work trip, and I am home alone. Maybe whatever it is likes the holidays. I think it's pretty wholesome, but creepy nonetheless. When I was growing up, my dad was a single parent who worked long hours, and all of his family lived back in Ireland. As a result, during the summer holidays, my brother and I were pretty much left to our own devices, even when I was seven and he was thirteen. This got us into a few scrapes down the years, but one that really freaks me out is Greaves Hall. If I remember correctly, Greaves Hall used to be an asylum but it was burned down a few times and lay in derelict for the last few decades. It was also one of very few points of interest in banks during the short period of time which I lived there. Last I saw of it, they were building a new housing estate there, so hopefully they pulled it down. But I've not been to banks for years. As I'm sure you'd expect, the site has a reputation as being haunted. Anyway, one day, when England was experiencing its annual two weeks of summer, 
My brother and his mates decided to go down to Grief's Hall. Normally, it was to kick a football about, but we all knew that they were really going there to stare at the ruin and make up some arbitrary reason why they all bitched out of going in. Being the bratty little sister, I was kind enough to point this out. Unfortunately, my big brother is also a twatty older brother. He would basically called my bluff after I'd spent several minutes calling them fannies. So, with a sinking feeling in my stomach, I set off with them. We stopped by the corner shop for some 90s approved levels of sugary snack food. One of my brother's mates slipped the guy some cash for two massive bottles of white lightning and some cigarettes. This made me very excited because I was convinced I was going to get to drink and become really good at pool. So we walked to the hall. My brother, his five friends and me tagging along at the back. I tried to be involved in the conversation, but they maintained it was for adults only, and then they went on about talking about she chest. I think they were starting to regret bringing me. Things settled down once we got onto the grounds. We had a 30 minute kickabout, during which I bagged a hat trick and nearly revenellied right into a tree. After the game, we poked around the grounds. One of my brother's friends got very interested in a tag someone left on one of the walls of what looked like a barn or a depot or something. It was hard to tell what its original purpose had been. We stopped by the water tower, where my brother managed to hook a used condom on the end of a stick and then chase everyone around with it. Next came an e-number and an alcohol-laden lunch. And then, just as the heat of the day passed, we found ourselves with nothing left to do but head to the main hall. Go on then, my brother said, nodding towards the building. After you, I replied, proud of myself. I had been working on that one all afternoon. Having mugged my brother right off, I let him lead the way with a shamble to his step and Dutch courage in his heart. The rest of us filed in behind. To be honest, the hall itself was disappointing. It looked very scary from the outside, crumbling away and fire damaged, with foliage overgrowing the outside of the building. Most of the windows were long since smashed, leaving these gaping black spaces even on a sunny day. Inside though, it was just a building, kinda like any building that age. You could tell it had been grand once, but now the paint was crumbling the floors peeling up. My brother and his friends got bored of poking around the ground floor quickly. They went up the rotten staircase one at a time, but I was confined to the ground floor. This might sound like my brother being protective, but he's used me to test similar staircases in the past, so I think he just wanted rid of me. Anyway, my dad's always bollocked me if I didn't do as my big brother says so I kicked in my heels downstairs for a while. There was a big room which I think might have been a canteen once, but even then, you could tell it had been posh, tile floors and such. So I passed some time twirling around pretending to be a ballerina. The others must have found something because they were gone for a while. So eventually I got bored and went back to exploring. I was just investigating a gnarly looking black fungus growing out of the wall when I saw that one of the doors that was either locked or swollen shut had a hole in it, just wide enough for a scrawny seven-year-old. With the minimum of grunting and no concept of the tetanus risk I was running, I managed to scrape my way past the door into a moldy smelling room with a sluice and a load of cleaning equipment. There were a lot of brown pellets on the floor, which I now realize were from rats. The ceiling was partly collapsed in one corner as well, so naturally, I decided it would be totally safe to climb onto an old basin, then a locker, and then scramble up the wall until I could pull myself onto the next floor. I was quite pleased with myself at this point, lying on the damp floorboards in a room that was empty, other than an overturned bed. I pretty much jumped straight up when I heard my brother and his friends laughing. I was already hatching plans of how I could mess with them in this haunted asylum, and then I saw something outside the window. There was a man, dressed in a black overcoat and a hat, 
standing just inside the tree line of the woods. It's hard to judge heights when you're a runty little girl standing on the first floor, but he looked well over six feet tall and wide. And I remember that vividly. He wasn't fat per se, but he was incredibly broad-shouldered. Looking back, I assume he was a homeless guy or something, but he looked neater than a homeless man, and his posture didn't strike me of that as someone living on the street. He stood up straight, staring through the empty window into a room where I could hear my brother and his friends laughing. Being chronically thick, I pretty much ignored this guy, under the cast iron logic that he wasn't supposed to be here. Because if he was, he would have been wearing a high-vis jacket. I went back to looking around the room. That's when I saw the stuff. It had been hidden when I was on the floor, behind the rusted bed frame. But now as I walked over to it, I saw, and smelled, the signs of someone living there. There was a sleeping bag that smelled bad enough to make me gag. A few scraps of newspaper, a tow rope a tangled heap of clothes, and beside it all, a big, mean-looking knife. I remember pondering to myself whether it was a sword or a knife at that size, and looking back, I think the blade must have been a good 18 inches long. It was covered in a black oily substance, and what looked like crusted blood. I was reaching down to pick it up, because no sense of self-preservation when I remembered the guy in the tree line. I froze, doing the arithmetic needed to work out just how screwed I might be. That sort of turned into a paralysis of indecision and fear that rooted me to the spot for a full minute, and then I heard the sound of feet scraping against the stone at the bottom of the window by my head. As is my default response, I turned tail and ran out of the room, along a molded hallway and into the room where my brother was. I want to go home. I managed to mumble. How did you get up here? He was going to take too long to agree. I knew it. I didn't tell him about the man, but at that point I was absolutely convinced that this big bear of a guy was going to come gut us with his knife any minute. I tried a different tactic. I want to go home now, I said, looking down at my feet. It was a look I'd perfected after the years of asking to sleep in his bed if we'd watched a scary film. Who's the fanny now, Sam? My brother's fat friend said. Belt up, she's just a kid, my brother replied. Normally, I'd have gone into full brat mode at that comment, but I was desperate to leave, so I let it slide. I pretty much dragged them out of the place, even if his fat friend took his time getting down the stairs. As we got outside, I grabbed the bottle of white lightning from my big brother and took off towards the entrance, boasting about how I was going to give it to Dad. It had the desired effect of getting them all to leave as fast as they could. I tried not to look back, because I knew I'd piss myself if I saw the man. But as we rounded the corner back to the street, I couldn't help myself. Truthfully, I don't know if I saw it. All I saw was that big scary building with its pitch black windows. He could have been in any one of them. This happened about six years ago. But first, a little backstory. Back then, I was in university and lived about ten hours away from my parents. It was a long drive, and our hometown was super boring, so I only ever visited for Christmas. That year, though, because I was going through a bad breakup, I went home for the summer, wanting to just be lazy and sunbathe in my parents' garden while reading trashy novels. Luck was in that my cousin next door was also visiting her mom. My parents had a big dog that looked scary, but it was a gentle giant and a surrogate mother to our kittens. Anyway, I was home for a couple of months and my parents were going on holiday for two weeks to the other side of the country. I was okay being home alone, although it was a bit weird, because at this point, I had been living in a big city for a few years, and I wasn't used to everything being so quiet at night. 
All I could hear was crickets and sometimes wild animals from nearby mountains. It made it hard to sleep, so I decided to move into my parents' bedroom because they had a TV in there and I could keep it on all night for some noise. One night, my cousin came to spend the night. It was because her mother was working that night and she didn't want to be home alone. We decided to watch horror movies and eat pizza in bed. At some point I fell asleep, but my cousin couldn't sleep. She was quite jumpy and easily scared, so the movies got her freaked out. I'm deep asleep when she wakes me up, super freaked out. She's saying someone is in the house. My mind is foggy and I can barely keep my eyes open. I tell her she's being paranoid and should go back to sleep, but she insists that there's someone in the house, and she's shaking and crying. I'm starting to worry about her. I sit up and I hear a noise downstairs, as if someone closed the cutlery drawer in the kitchen. I flinch and put the TV on mute. I get up and slowly lock the bedroom door. I then tiptoe back to bed and listen carefully. I hear the wooden floors creaking as if someone's walking around. At this point, I'm starting to join Anna in freaking out. My parents have a sensor light in the hallway. It is placed roughly in the middle of the stairs, so it will go off if someone's walking around both upstairs or downstairs. I can hear the click of the light going on, and I can see the light under the bedroom door. I'm now 100% sure someone's in the house. I grab my phone to call the police, but the town is in the middle of nowhere, and to top that off, I have no service. My cousin is bawling. I have to put a pillow over her mouth to muffle the noise. She's holding the pillow and bites down on it to stop herself from screaming. Whoever is in the house is now climbing up the stairs. My mind is going a hundred miles an hour. I'm trying to think of all the possible scenarios. My best bet is that a neighbor noticed my parents' car has been gone for a few days. They know our dog is harmless, and they know my folks are doing quite well for themselves, so they're probably trying to find some jewelry or something. I figure if we keep quiet, they'll take whatever they want and go. I quietly tell my cousin to get under the bed. I look out of the window and see nobody on the street. Since my parents' bedroom is next to mine, and mine has a balcony, I figure if push comes to shove, we can climb out of the window, reach the balcony, and since it's overlooking the vegetable garden, we can jump and hop onto the soft soil so we won't break too many bones. As I move to crawl under the bed, the doorknob rattles. Someone is trying to get in. I freeze, and I swear time stops. My heart is beating like crazy. I look around and the only weapon I can see is my mom's crochet needle in the basket by the bed. I figure I'm going to stab whoever this is in the eye or something. The doorknob rattles for a few more seconds, and then the intruder walks away. I hear them shuffling through the rest of the rooms on the floor but I figure whoever this is is too quick to actually take anything. Worst thoughts creep into my head. My dad is a detective. He's worked some horrible cases, involving sex trafficking rings and stuff like that. So what if someone is here for him, and it wouldn't be the first time our family was threatened? If that's the case, I might be dead by the morning. This thought shoots adrenaline through my body, and when I can't hear anything for a few minutes, I decide I have to get out of the room, find some service, and call the police. My cousin begs me to stay, but all I can think about is if someone is after revenge, they could burn the house down with us in it or something. Also, as stupid as it may sound right now, I was really worried for my dog too. She was out there all alone. If someone was to approach her, She'd probably lick their fingers right before they shot her or something. Anyway, I take my phone, my crochet needle, and leave the room. I step into my parents' dressing room and take my dad's baseball bat. I then make my way downstairs. The front door is wide open, and as I walk outside, I can see a man running away. I immediately call the police, and to my surprise, 
streets, they tell me a call was already made for my address. They're on their way. I assume my cousin somehow made the call while I was gone, so I didn't question it. The police arrive in less than a minute. It wasn't my cousin who called. It takes us a while to understand what's going on. The officer is as confused as I am. In the end, what happened was my neighbors weren't aware I was home for the summer. They knew my parents were gone, and when they saw the lights on in the house, they started to worry. I didn't lock the door that night, and my dog has the habit of opening it with her paws and napping on the sofa downstairs. She probably opened the door at some point in the evening, and then decided to go back out, and the door was left wide open. My neighbor thought someone was robbing us, so he came in. He went into the kitchen to take a knife from the drawer and walked around to see if anyone was in the house. He called the police at some point, and when I got out of the bedroom, he heard me. He got spooked and ran away. I was 16 and we met on Facebook. He went to a school nearby and we decided to meet up for a movie. We had a great time together and ended up dating. First, he came to my parents' house. He had on an ankle monitor for house arrest and he wouldn't tell anyone why. That was red flag number one. And since he was a minor, we couldn't find out. My parents obviously didn't allow us to hang out. So we hung out at his house or around town at the YMCA camp. I was rebellious and naive. Things started to get weird when I noticed his family was pretty odd. One day, we were getting up to things in his bedroom, and I saw his father looking through the blinds. I screamed and called him out, and his dad ran off. The stalker guy told me that his dad was just into redheads and liked to watch us. So apparently this wasn't the first time. I went to leave and his mom was doing crack in the kitchen, so I decided it was time to break up. This is when it got bad. He started crying and told me that he's in cancer treatment, and that's why he needs me. He doesn't have long to live, blah blah blah. I believed him and told him we could be friends. This is when the stalking started. He switched schools to my high school, but never went to class. He would just stand outside my classroom looking inside until it was passing period. When I would leave class, he wouldn't address me. He would just follow about 10 to 15 feet behind me to my next period, and then stand outside the classroom again. I was too intimidated to say something to him, so I just let it happen for weeks. It started to progress to where he would follow me home every day. He would get on the same bus as me, despite living across town, and he'd walk 10 to 15 feet behind me all the way to my house. He would stand outside, just staring up at the window, until around the time my parents got home, and then he would just leave. Finally, I got the courage to tell him where to go and to leave me alone. I told him we could no longer be friends or acquaintances, and he should forget about me. However, that only escalated things. I started getting about 150 calls a night. Half of them were him screaming death threats, and in detail torture methods that he wanted to do to me. And the other half were him singing me love songs that he wrote on his guitar. Every time I blocked his number, he seemed to just magically get a new one and leave me more messages on that. I woke up one day to see that overnight, he had left me one of those dancing and singing snowmen on my porch. He had stabbed it in the head, and the knife was still sticking out. He covered it in his liquid deodorant that I had previously mentioned liking the smell of, and I noticed there was a hole where the little song recording device was. When I pressed the hand, it was not the regular Frosty the Snowman song that played. It was his voice singing eerily. I'm gonna hate you forever. I'm never gonna let you be. It was done at this point and I told my parents. They contacted the school. The school suspended him, but he still waited at my bus stop every day. 
and he continued to walk with me to my home. One day he ran at me, like he was going to tackle me. When I tensed up for impact, he stopped and hugged me. It wasn't a regular hug, it was like he was trying to crush me. I was five foot one and about 90 pounds at the time. He ended up cracking one of my ribs. I cried and he started crying too before running off. He left me a voicemail apologizing in song. This one night is the night I'll never forget and it's the reason we got a restraining order and why my dad got a gun. I woke up one evening for no reason. I was just fully awake. I got up to go to my kitchen to get a glass of water to relax, and in the reflection of my fridge, I saw movement in my backyard. I couldn't see very well because it was dark outside, and it conflicted with the light inside, so I went to the back sliding glass door to get a better look. When I got closer, I was met with the silhouette of a six foot four man standing just outside the door. This stalker guy was in my backyard under my room at 3 a.m. He was just staring at me. I yelled and my parents got up, but he was gone by the time my dad went outside. There's a patio right outside my bedroom window that goes all the way to the ground, so it's possible he could have been on top of the patio, looking directly into my bedroom window before. We had a restraining order granted shortly after that, and my stalker dropped out of school. I haven't seen him in person since, but every six months or so, he makes a new Facebook and tries to friend request me. I just block it and report it every time. It's really scary stuff. Has anyone ever heard of the myth that if you wake up in the middle of the night for no reason, there's likely something looking at you? Well, maybe it's true. I don't know what he's doing now or where he went, but I don't care to know. One night, I was in bed with my boyfriend. It was about 1.30am. I get a text from a random number saying, Is this Jenny? Sorry for messaging late and out of the blue like this. But I don't think Chris has been honest with me, and I need to talk to you. We exchange a few messages, and they're basically accusing my boyfriend of cheating on both of us. Obviously, I was annoyed, but bear in mind it was June 2020 bang in the middle of the coronavirus lockdown in the UK. We'd spent every day together since March. He denied it all and insisted he didn't know this person. And then the same number starts messaging him. Angry messages calling him a lying grat. It's not looking good for him, but this is where it gets weird. This person gives no specifics. They won't tell me their name, what my boyfriend has done. Only that I was a liar and an idiot for believing him. I'd ask, but they would just reply fake, angry messages. Their grammar and spelling was good, but they'd use slang words from our local area. We assumed that maybe it was some kids who found our numbers off of Facebook, and maybe they were having a laugh, so we tried to ignore it. Then nothing. Until my boyfriend gets a message the following afternoon asking him to meet them at the local social club for some company. Me and a friend got straight in the car and went down there. No one was there and the club was closed due to the pandemic, but we couldn't help feel like we were being watched. It was really weird. A few days go by and the same number starts texting me again. This time, the language is all weird like spelling mistakes and saying the letter U and the number 2 instead of saying U2. It felt like it was a different person texting me. They seemed a lot angrier with me now, because I didn't believe them straight away. And then they text me, You're so dull, Jenny. I seen him leaving your house earlier. LMAO. Cocky, I said something like, Funny that. Where's my house then? And then they reply with my street name. They also knew things about us, like the fact he was in the army. I called them quite a few times, but it would just ring twice and cut off. I tried searching the number on WhatsApp and on a few social media sites, but nothing, 
and it was only on Instagram the number would come up with the location of a film company in Ralta, Netherlands. When I'd Google the number, its provider is Tizmi. I've never heard of it, but it looks like it just might be a fake number. They've never asked for any money or anything like that either. I don't get why someone would go through that much effort just to wind us up. The last text I had was, Okay, you will see eventually. LMAO. And that was creepy. This happened seven years ago while I was living in a small town in Illinois. My youngest was a few weeks old, so I was up frequently to feed him. So I slept downstairs with them, while my husband and the two older children slept upstairs. I was woken up to someone knocking on the door. I was half asleep, and my only thought was getting to the door before it woke everyone up. I was so sleep deprived I wasn't thinking straight, otherwise I probably wouldn't have answered the door so late at night. As I was heading to the door, my baby started to wake up, so I brought him with me. I open the door and a man is standing there. I said to him, how can I help you? And he just stands there for a second and doesn't say anything. At this point, I'm starting to wake up enough to be observant. And I remember feeling like he seemed nervous, which made me anxious. All he said was, I'm sorry, I thought you ordered a pizza. Then he grabbed a box off of the table on the porch and walked away. I don't remember what I even said to him. I closed the door and stood there feeling a bit strange, thinking about how weird it was, but I told myself he just had the wrong house. As I'm walking back to the living room, I saw the clock and my stomach dropped. It was a little after 2am, there are no places around that deliver that late. I went back to look outside, but I didn't see anyone, and there were no cars on the street. I made sure all the doors were locked. I just remember sitting there a bit shaken, thinking about how off the situation felt. So here are a few things. Number one, normally a pizza guy just says hi and tells you how much you owe. All he said was, I'm sorry, I thought you ordered a pizza. Number two, the box was not with him. I didn't see it until he grabbed it off the table as he exited my porch. The table is a few feet away from the door. If he was holding it, I probably wouldn't have asked him how I could help him. I would have said he had the wrong house or something. Number three. I don't remember him wearing anything associated with a pizza place or a name tag. The only place nearby was a pizza hut. And number four. Nothing was open that late. And I'm sure about that. The nervous vibe I got from him still tells me something was off. What was he doing? And if he had bad intentions, I think either that he saw that I had dogs or that I was carrying a baby changed his mind. Whenever I think about this, I get the chills. I feel very lucky that nothing happened that night. I'm 5'3", 115 pounds so I guess I'm pretty small. That's my reasoning for being very submissive all over this. When I first started working at this fast food chain, I was 16, and it was my first job, and I was excited to finally take my first steps into adulthood. This co-worker of mine was training me. We'll call him Frank. Frank, at first glance, looks young, 19 or 21 at the most. We got along, and nothing too bad nor alarming, just light conversations about anime and such. I remember things started to change slightly when he was talking about video game characters, and none of her co-workers knew who it was. When I saw the green hat character, I said, Oh, that's Link. How cute. I used to watch my brother play The Legend of Zelda Four Swords. He looked at me and said, Marry me. I laughed it off and continued on with my day. For the rest of my shift, he would hover over me, asking me personal questions like my age, 
favorite things and stuff like that. Being the open, friendly person I was, I answered happily. I told him how I loved butterflies and that I was 16. I am now 17 and have had several jobs since. When an older man asks for your age as a minor, it's never a nice sign. Moving on to December. I've been at this chain for a month now. My manager asked me if I wanted to come to their company's secret Santa party. And I agreed. When the day came, I arrived with my now ex-best friend. Frank arrives on the phone, acting busy and such, and I thought nothing of it. During the whole party, he was on the phone. I was getting food when he tapped on my shoulder, while still being on the phone and he handed me a beautiful butterfly necklace. I didn't know what to say besides thanking him, thinking he was my secret Santa. And then later, my other co-worker comes up to me, handing me a gift card to Starbucks and a plush. I ask why, and she said she was my secret Santa. I thought it must have been a mistake, and went on with my night listening to my old best friend, telling me how I should date Frank, which, in my mind, was never on the table. January rolls around, and it was Frank's birthday. We were just working until I heard one of my girl co-workers wish him a happy birthday. Being that person, I wish him a happy birthday while my other co-worker asks how old he's turning. He said 27. Might I add that every shift I worked with him, he would take several photos of me before and after my shift, commenting about my hair my skin and eyes. He often said how cute my nose was, and again, not wanting to cause a scene, I just laugh everything off, and that's always the case, isn't it? We never want to cause a scene. I did start telling him to please stop, but of course he wouldn't, no matter how many times I asked him to. Now, I'm going to skip to May, my birthday month, and of course... I was working on my birthday. I went to the back door as usual. Due to COVID, I had to ring a doorbell and wait for someone to open the door. Out of nowhere, Frank pops out of the bushes, handing me all kinds of gifts. Today was his day off too, so I was confused. I remember thinking, how the hell did he know my birthday? I've never talked about it since I don't like celebrating it. He followed me around for a few minutes before awkwardly leaving when I apologize I want to get to work and I don't want to get yelled at. And July is when I finally found a new job. I quit due to sexual harassment I had to endure for the nine months I worked there from my shift lead. That's a whole other story. But when a man starts getting handsy, don't laugh it off. Shut that shit down. It got really bad when the ex-best friend that I mentioned earlier started showing all my co-workers including Frank and that shift lead, explicit photos of me that she stole off my phone without me knowing. I was very insecure at the time, and I was in an abusive relationship, so I would give anything this boy asked of me. Anyways, at that point I about had it. After being interrogated about that shift lead, I put in my two weeks. On my last week, Everyone was talking about how that shift lead got laid off for sexual harassment. Frank and I were doing dishes and the topic came up. I awkwardly told him about it, not knowing how everyone knew my story. The shift lead would often grab my ass, rub my thigh, talk about my chest, and about if they were bigger. The things he would do to me. I would say stop politely, but he would continue. When I started yelling and saying stop more assertively, he would often make me do humiliating tasks, like clean the greasy floors on my hands and knees, or cleaning the dining room when it was closed due to COVID. When I told this to Frank, he shrugged it off and said that was no reason for him to be fired. I remember being absolutely shocked, retorting, I'm just glad I'm leaving this hellhole, and left it at that. A month into my new job as a hostess, Everything was going well. It's a restaurant, but everyone just comes there to drink, so it's more of a bar. On one of my 2am shifts, Frank stops by on his bike. I try to be friendly, but I was getting frustrated when he kept cutting me off from talking to other people. 
I then walked by to bus tables because no one else would do it, and he couldn't follow me into the restaurant. After busting all the tables, I come up to the counter to see my co-workers giggling. What's happening? I asked. The other hostess smiled. That's so cute how your boyfriend takes photos of you while you're working. That's so cute how obsessive he is over you. He wouldn't stop talking about you to us. What boyfriend? I wasn't still happily remained single after all that bullshit of a relationship. The only person they could be referring to was Frank. Then it dawned on me. How the hell did he know where I was working and my shift schedule? I didn't tell anyone besides my parents and my brother. A week goes by and Frank comes back. I may have gotten a little overdramatic, but I didn't know what else to do. I told the other host at the counter to tell him I'm not working today and dashed inside. I told my manager that this man keeps taking photos of me while I'm working and it's making me uncomfortable. My manager told me to stay in the back room while he went out and handled the situation. Our restaurant is very popular in the area, so it's very crowded in the front. Frank with his bike was blocking customers, and that's what my manager was telling him. My idiotic ass was popping my head up a little under that back room window where I could see what was going on in the front. I freak out a bit when I see Frank get aggressive with my manager. He begins thrashing when my manager tries to lead him out the front. Suddenly, Frank throws his bike and tries heading into the building. A few male waiters see what's happening and were informed by my manager. I remember one waiter standing in the back room with me, watching the door, as another was practically fighting with Frank. I could only hear yelling outside the door, and then it went quiet. I spent the rest of the shift like that cleaning silverware with that male server. From then on, people would walk me to my car, even if it was broad daylight. From August to November, he would be on his bike, passing by the restaurant from a distance. He would just be watching and taking photos for 10 to 20 minutes before leaving. Now the reason I thought of putting this here was due to it becoming more intense, and not just looking from a distance anymore. Due to COVID, I'm not needed anymore because now my restaurant is takeout only. I've been working seasonal jobs while working at the restaurant, but now I'm not working, waiting to get my schedule. Because I was bored this day, I drive to my local mall to do a little Christmas shopping. While driving, I look in my rearview mirror to see a recognizable face. It was Frank. I practically choke on spit seeing his face in my mirror. I try not to get the best of myself and knock it off as a coincidence, but it wasn't. He followed me throughout the mall, then later followed me as I was driving home. No one knows where I live, so I drove for an hour, getting lost and taking every random turn I could, until I lost him. I now believe this is how he could track me down. My car isn't common, but it doesn't stand out too much. I've rarely left my house since. It's January 2021, and ever since the start of this new year, I've been getting phone calls like this. Hello? Hello? And then the caller would abruptly end the call. Along with that, I've gotten many random messages asking about gifts and delivering me a gift. I'm not one who usually uses social media, but these messages were all over mine. All of them were from newly made accounts across Snapchat and Instagram. On one occasion, an account started sending me photos, photos that I never sent to anyone. These were photos of my cat and I that I saved in my Snapchat album. Just photos after photos of things I've never sent and ending with, I have a gift for you. I deleted both apps, along with deleting almost everything off my phone. A week ago I downloaded Snapchat again due to some dumb assignment my teacher wanted us to do with that crap social media app. One of my old co-workers sent me a message. I open it. It said, Frank wants to give you a Christmas gift. Do you want to stop by? 
Maybe I'm just overreacting, or maybe those accounts were frank. I just want to say my personality has changed because of all of this. I'm very protective now. I rarely talk to anyone, and I'm not as friendly as I was then. It's only been a little over a year, yet I feel like I've aged 10 plus. I just want to say to Frank, let's not meet, and screw your Christmas gift. This is a story about a time when I found out I was more naive than I thought I was. I think we all have stories like this from when we were young. I'm a female, and when I was in my 20s I dropped out of college and worked for a call center a few years before finishing my degree. The place I worked paid a lot higher than most call center work, so it had relatively low turnover and people stayed there for a long time and developed friendships with their co-workers. I became friends with a guy whose desk was next to mine, because we worked the same shift. We'll call him Brad. Brad was seven or eight years older than me, and was married with a daughter. We hit it off right away, because we were both cynical and sarcastic, and we often thought we were the most sophisticated people in our call center, believing many of our co-workers to be rubes and goody two-shoes. We started hanging out sometimes after work, going out for beers. Brad lived in the next city over, which is about 30 miles away. Traffic was always terrible going back to his town in the evening, so sometimes he wanted to chill and blow off some steam while letting the traffic thin out. I was still at the stage where drinking in a bar was a novelty, so I was happy to get after work beers. I was never attracted to Brad. To my mind, we were nothing more than work buddies. He was married with a kid, and I'm not attracted to cheaters. Even if Brad hadn't been married, his personality would have prevented me from being attracted to him, because he could be really annoying. Brad was really pushy with his opinions. He was always trying to force books, CDs, and DVDs on me, and then would pester me relentlessly afterwards, asking how I liked it. He was always really insistent that I agree that whatever he recommended was better than the stuff I liked. This may not sound like much, but it was super annoying and totally invalidating. We didn't have the same taste, so I never liked the stuff he recommended. I quit accepting things from him after about the second time, but he would still try to force books and things on me, and he'd pout when I told him I wasn't interested in taking them. The only other time I've had people do this was when I was dating them, and I didn't like it then either. I eventually got fired for clocking in one minute late from lunch, or breaking another of the pointlessly draconian call center rules. Brad took me out for beers the day I got fired, and I fully expected to never see him or any of my other call center co-workers again. A few weeks later, however, Brad texted me on a Saturday night to say he'd been out with friends in my town, and if I wanted to meet up for beers. I told him no, that I was in for the night. He texted me back that he just bought a six-pack and was headed to my house. He knocked on my door about a minute later. I'm definitely not the type of person who appreciates unexpected visitors. I cursed the fact that I'd invited Brad to a party a few weeks earlier and given him my address. I couldn't see any way out of it, so I let him in and drank a few beers while he went on about various co-workers that I was no longer interested in. When I started getting tired at about 10.30, I asked Brad to leave. He started pouting and whining that it was too early, and he didn't want to have to go home yet. I had to push him out of the door. I ghosted Brad after that. I would get messages periodically on Saturday nights that just said, You home? Or worse, one saying, I did a drive-by and it looks like your car is gone. Are you out? Do you want to meet up? He even knocked on my door a few times when I was home, to which I hid until he was gone. He never did this stuff when we worked together. I didn't know why he was so interested now. I don't know why he was so presumptuous in thinking that showing up at my house was okay, other than that I was single and he assumed I wanted company. A year and a half after I'd quit working with Brad, I ran into him downtown. I'd been having lunch with some friends and was walking back to my car, 
when I spotted him sitting outside a cafe by himself. He waved me over and I ended up having a coffee with him. He whined at me about ghosting him, and because I was so young and didn't know any better, the guilt trip worked. He talked me into letting him come over with beers that night, for a low-key hangout. Brad showed up later that evening with a six-pack and some crappy book that his friend had written that he said I just had to read. From the minute he got there, all he wanted to talk about were these co-workers at the call center who had an affair and left their spouses for each other. This was hot gossip that I was missing out on since I no longer worked there. I honestly didn't care because I no longer worked there, but Brad would not shut up about it. He analyzed it in great detail, speculating about all the different aspects of their relationship and how it affected their kids and their exes and all kinds of things that were none of my concern. I regretted letting him invite himself over. Somehow, the word orgasm came up in conversation. Brad took the opportunity to say, When was the last time you had one that was given to you by someone else? All of the air went out of the room. Now I understand why he wanted to come over to my house so badly. For some reason, I thought he wasn't that kind of person. Stupid me. You need to leave, I said. I messed up, he replied. I didn't mean anything by it. I was just wondering. You need to leave, I repeated. Oh, you're not mad at me, are you? He asked with a surprised look on his face. I walked over to the front door and opened it. Leave now. Don't call me. Don't text me. Don't show up here with beers. Get out. He continued to stare at me incredulously. Wow, you're actually mad. I just glared back at him. He shrugged and set his beard down. Okay, boss. He walked slowly to the door, still with a disbelieving look on his face. Once he got over the threshold, he turned to look at me again and started to say something else. I shut the door in his face. He immediately called me and left me a long voicemail, which I didn't listen to and continued on with the periodic texting and voicemails in the following weeks, as well as an invitation to a Halloween party that he and his wife were throwing. I would have blocked him, but this was way before you could easily do that. I never spoke to him again, and when he later tried to friend me on social media, I blocked him. I know this isn't creepy in the same way being followed home by a stranger is creepy, and Brad didn't get aggressive and left when I asked him to. But it could have gone differently. He was in my house and nobody knew he was there. He invited himself over and showed up at my house for months. Even though I'd ignored him, he didn't respect my boundaries when I asked him to stop contacting me. And I'm not a flirty person. I didn't lead him on or make him think I was interested in him, other than having conversations about books and movies and stuff. I thought we were friends, and he thought we were going to have an affair. I hope his wife left his dumb ass. When I was 19, I was the assistant manager at a shoe store in a sort of outlet mall. One day I was working alone because we were super understaffed. I think at the time, there were only four employees working for our store. Our manager was split between our sister store and our store. Two women came in and were shopping for shoes and spent a while trying stuff on. About 15 minutes after they came in, this creepy guy came into the store and smiled at me in this eerie way. I immediately felt uneasy. I can still vividly remember the guy's face and his clothes. He was wearing coral colored trousers, a button up shirt, and a trench coat. He had those huge 80s glasses and greasy black hair. He walked around the store slowly and kept watching me from over the shelves, always smiling. It was a small store and he kept alternating between the men and women sections. The women finally came up to pay and I was getting nervous because they were about to leave and I'd be alone in there with him. I thought about saying something to the women to see if they'd stay but thought it might just sound crazy. After they left, I darted out one of the big entry doors. 
There were two on adjacent sides of the store. I ran over to our sister's store across the way and told a guy I had befriended about what had happened. He went over to my store as the guy was walking out quickly. He came back to his store and immediately called security. He agreed that it was super creepy. Security found the guy and said something to him, but I'm not sure what. The guy immediately left the mall. I had my friend walk me to my car when we got off of work. About a week later, the same guy came in while I was working. One of my co-workers was there with me, luckily. I was running the cash register, and the guy walked around a few minutes, looking at shoes, and then grabbed some socks and came to the checkout. The whole time, he gave me a disgusting grin. He knew I called security on him. He took his bag and watched me as he left. I never saw him again, but I felt nervous about it for the rest of the time I worked there, which was only for another couple of months. I don't know if the guy would have actually done anything. I was 5 foot 6 and about 130 pounds at the time. I felt like he was getting pleasure out of making me nervous. I still get the creeps when I think about it. This happened several years ago. I used to work in retail shortly after graduating high school for a certain sunglasses retailer. The dress code for women was business casual, but fashionable, being that it was a high-end retailer. The store was in an outdoor mall, so everything was a standalone shop. I had been there for about a year when this happened, and it was when I was opening and closing the store on my own, counting the cash and making deposits. It was a summer night, so I was wearing a skirt that day. I'll admit that it was a bit shorter than I would dare to wear to my 9 to 5 now. We were short staffed that day, so we had a rep from another store helping me out that evening. I cannot remember his name, so we'll call him Joe. He was fine most of the day, and we actually had mutual friends, so I was comfortable. That is until I was closing. We had locked the doors from the inside and began on night duties. Mine was closing out the register while Joe did whatever the hell he was doing. I wasn't too concerned since it wasn't his store, and I didn't feel like explaining where things were to him. It was getting pretty late, so the strip mall started shutting lights off, setting the tone for the creepy night I was about to encounter. Standing at the register, my back towards the stock room where Joe was, I felt what I thought was a fly on the back of my thigh. I brushed it away and kept going through the closeout process, which was a minute or two from being completed and then leaving. About 30 seconds later, I felt a prick on my thigh in the same spot. I turned around to see what was touching me, and there was Joe. Crouched down on the ground, trying to look up my skirt with his index finger, barely touching my upper thigh. Literally right behind me. Joe jumped up and walked to the back. Needless to say, I'm in panic mode inside. It was late enough that no one was walking around the center anymore, and it was quite dark out. I tried to remain calm and act like I didn't see him, afraid if I freaked out, he would do something crazy. I quickly grabbed the deposit bag, grabbed my purse and my keys, and I told him everything was done and we could leave. To get to the parking area, you had to wind through various walkways to a large parking lot that stretched along the backside of the retail center. It was probably a three or four minute walk in total to get to the parking lot. Joe walked next to me, not saying anything, until we were about halfway to the lot. Do you need a ride to your car? He asked. No thanks, my car is just right over there. Thank you though. He asked me a couple more times, where I still politely declined. Finally, he answered with, Let me take you to your car. At this point, I booked it to my car, and I got in and locked the doors, and then drove off. The next day, I called my manager and explained the story, pretty much crying because I was still so shaken up. HR called me, which is a big deal, because this is a big corporate company. They explained I didn't have any proof, and the best they could do is not schedule us together. I was pretty pissed off, but I was glad I didn't have to work with them again. For some reason, I ended up looking him up on our county court records later that day. Lo and behold, there he was, 
with past charges for sexual assault. I called my manager and told him. Needless to say, he was fired, and HR was extremely apologetic. So I just met this guy today because of work reasons, and lunch is approaching. Lunch starts. He comes up to me, and he asks if I can give him a ride somewhere on base. Just a note, I'm in the military. I'm not really comfortable with this idea. I just met him. He is a bigger guy, and I'm a short female. I told him, sorry, my car is full of boxes, and it's kind of messy, so... He says he doesn't mind. I repeat, I have boxes everywhere. Sorry. He didn't say anything after that, so I assumed he got the hint. I started walking ahead of him to get to my car. I open it and get in, and then I turn to see him opening my car door. I just kind of watched as he started moving stuff out of my passenger seat and into the back. I'm kind of awestruck and just watch him. He sits down and then turns to me and says, Oh, I need to grab something from my room real quick. He gets out. I'm kind of freaked out at this point, and I decide screw it. I pull out of the parking lot and just drive away. He really creeped me out. Was it an asshole move, or is it okay considering the circumstances? I was walking back home at about 10.30 after a couple of drinks with friends. I wasn't drunk in the slightest. About five minutes away from my house, I noticed a middle-aged man behind me. Alarm bells started going off in my head as it feels like he's staring at me. I pick up my pace and so does he. So I made a beeline for my house and messaged my roommate that I was due home in a couple of minutes, just in case. I swing around my street corner and fumble to get my keys out of my bag so I can get in as quick as possible, and I'm very aware that this man is closing in on me. I get to my entryway, and as I'm trying to unlock my door, this guy barricades the archway and proceeds to beg for my number and calls me beautiful, saying that I should try to get to know him. The whole time I'm asking him to leave while I'm just trying to unlock my door, and that was hard because at this point I was shaking with fear. He reached out to grab me just as I opened my door, and I yell at him to fuck off. I get inside and slam the door in his face. I proceed to cry at my housemate who was mortified. It terrifies me to think what would have happened if I hadn't unlocked my door in time. Halloween night several years ago, I was followed home by a stranger. I worked at a large mall about an hour away from home. The store closes at 10pm, and the only bus home runs every hour, and it only dropped me off two-thirds of the way home. I would have to walk the rest of the way. This usually happened between 11 and 1am at night, depending on if I could get the store closed down on time, and if the bus wasn't too packed for me to get on. I'm not a small woman, I'm fairly tall, and fairly round, and not particularly attractive. My uniform is just a polo shirt and black trousers, flat shoes, all covered with a thick coat. I didn't see him get on the bus. To be fair, the bus was packed and noisy and the walkways were crowded, and I did my best to just block it all out with my headphones, staring straight out the window. I am not a people person, and having been at work for 12 hours on a busy day, surrounding by these same assholes, I was just pissed off and desperate to get off the bus and be alone. When we finally got to my stop, and I managed to struggle my way to the front of the bus, through people that refused to move, I stumbled into the night air and breathed a sigh of relief. A couple of people got off the bus behind me, and I started up the hill, crossing the road to continue up the side street that led to my road. The side street is very long and has offshoots into residential streets on very steep hills going down. The street itself is lined with small shops and there's a high grassy bank on the opposite side that has houses along the way to the top, so it feels very isolated after the shops close. Very few people get off at my bus at this time of night, 
and even fewer head in the same direction. Those that do cut off and go down one of the hills before I get to the hill that goes to my house. Now the street isn't very well lit. The street lamps are few and far between. Some of them are motion activated, so they don't even turn on until you ride on top of them. I've walked home in the dark this way a thousand times, and I've walked to work this way at 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning a thousand times too. Whilst I do enjoy the cool night air, I am not afraid of the dark and love how bright the stars are where I live. I don't loiter. I walk fast so I can get home and shower ASAP. This night, I noticed someone walking behind me, and as I said previously, not many people walk this way at this time of night. I was aware of him and waiting for him to turn down one of the side streets. He didn't. It felt a bit weird, but I'm not the only person that lives in this area, so maybe he just doesn't usually go this way at this time of night, so I've never seen him before. I get to the medical surgery and car park at the bottom of my hill, and I cut across it as always. At this point, I know if he also heads up my hill, I need to worry a bit more. This hill goes alongside the surgery and then there are high walls on my side of the street that block off the flats on the other side from my road. They're only accessible from the road before mine. At the top of the hill, this wall ends and turns into an alley that runs parallel to my building. The opposite side of the road has multiple closed pubs, a closed corner store, and an old church that's been converted into a mosque, which is also closed. There are even less street lamps here, and my building is surrounded by a metal fence. There's 20 or so feet of grass that slopes down to the entrance of the building where the doorway is lit up. The point is, it's isolated, and the only reason someone should be up here at this time of night is if they live in my building. This guy crosses the car park after me, and now I'm feeling concerned. I know he doesn't live in my building. There are nine flats over three floors and ten people. I know all of them, and they know me. We would recognize each other even in this level of darkness. So I walk faster up the hill, hoping to get in the building before he catches up, and he starts walking faster too. I can hear him gaining on me, and by the time I get to the gate, I know he's too close for me to be able to open the door and get inside before he's on me. The building is dark, and I know everybody is in bed. It makes me feel so alone at this point. So thinking quickly, I cross the road and walk further up the hill behind parked car. I use the opportunity to swing my backpack off of one shoulder and grab my keys. I wait for him to follow me and get behind the cars too. It'll take a bit longer for him to cross back over before I bolt across the road, throwing open the gate. I swing it hard behind me because he's running at me, and I think it will either latch before he can catch it, or it will hit him. Either way, it will buy me a few seconds. I slide down the slope barely staying on my feet because it's dangerously slippy when it's wet. I turn the corner at the bottom and slam my keycard on the reader, pressing hard on the heavy door before it beeps so it will open much faster. The door is heavy and on a fire safety hinge, and that means I can't slam it shut. The stairs are a couple of steps into the building, and to the left. I live on the top floor. It's not a big building. Three flats on each floor, two flights of stairs. It's also a concrete stairwell, so every little sound echoes and can be heard behind closed doors. I get inside the building and immediately bolt up the stairs. I'm only a few steps up when the door flies open behind me, and this guy comes after me. Feeling a bit more secure now I'm in my building, and only feet away from my neighbors, I spin around before he reaches me and slam my heavy backpack into him. He falls back to the landing and manages to catch himself by grabbing a hold of the rail. I scream at him, what the hell, at the top of my lungs and hold my bag in front of me. Now we're inside and the stairwell is lit by motion activated lights. I get my first proper look at him. He's a bit taller than me. I'm five foot eight and he's old enough to be graying. His clothes are weird, all made out of that weird waxy material some weatherproof jackets are and he's wearing heavy boots. I do not recognize him at all. He looks up at me with wide eyes as I stare down at him. I'm fully prepared to kick him in the face and throw my back if I have to. I don't want him to be able to follow me into my flat, so I stare him down. He begins to stutter, hands wriggling over the handrail and ducking his head a bit, trying to look pathetic and harmless. 
he mutters something about visiting his son. Like I stated before, nine people other than me live in this building, and none of them other than myself were young enough for him to be their parent. Even if his son did live here, how would he know to follow me off the bus to get to my building? Why didn't he follow me when I moved away from my building? And why did he give chase? He could have come to the building and bust up for his son to let him in. I began shouting at him to get out, repeating those words over and over again, sprinkling in, I don't know you, and you don't live here. He continues muttering, making excuses, but I shout over him. When I hear the neighbors moving around and coming towards their doors, probably to look through their peepholes, I begin to back up the stairs. My neighbor, right at the bottom of the stairs, behind the man, opens the door, leaving her chain on and peering through at us. She asks me if I'm okay and if she needs to call the police. The guy spins to stare at her, his hands out in the stop motion, and I hear another neighbor open his door behind the stairs. Also on the ground floor, he calls out to ask if everything's okay too, and I just yell out to the both of them. He followed me home. I don't know him, and he won't leave. I am now at the top of the first set of stairs, still looking down at him. My male neighbor starts yelling at him to get out, Either more intimidated by the man than he was me, or realizing he was outnumbered, he begins trying to open the front door. You have to press a button to get it open, and he clearly doesn't know this, and that's further evidence he's never been here before. Feeling more secure now I'm not alone and he's trying to leave, I bolt across the landing and up the final flight of stairs. I get my door open before locking it behind me. I was dripping sweat and very close to a panic attack. I dragged my hoover to the front door and propped it up. Just in case someone tried to open my door, I'd be able to hear the hoover fall. I didn't sleep very well at all, listening to every sound in the building. Unfortunately, I didn't have work the next day. I woke up about 6am to a lot of sound in the building's landings. I could hear people opening every bin chute room and coming back out again. I peered through my peephole to see uniformed policemen searching the common areas of the building. I didn't call the police, but I assume one of the neighbors downstairs did. The bin rooms were fairly large, so I imagine they were checking to see if someone was hiding in them. I don't know for sure, and I didn't ask, other than asking me if I was okay when we saw each other next. The neighbors that helped on that night never said anything else about it. I don't know who he was or what he wanted. I haven't seen him again, and I've since stopped working at that shopping center a couple of years later. I do feel guilty for not calling the police, just in case he had done this before or since. And if that was the case, maybe the person didn't manage to get away. But at the time, I just wanted to forget about it and move forward. When I was about nine years old, my family and I lived in a house with a fairly big wooded area behind our backyard. I say fairly big because it wasn't big enough that you could really get lost in there for very long. But it was big enough that you could walk into it for a good 20 minutes before getting to the center. It got pretty thick in some areas. You couldn't see any of the houses from the neighborhood once you got inside. To my friends and I, it was a magical world. We played in those woods all summer long. My mom would let us go in there as long as we were back by sundown. This was the early 90s and times were a little different back then. My best friend would come over and we would run out there to play for hours. We played hide and seek, army, Star Wars, and anything we could think of. But our very favorite thing to do was climb trees. We had a favorite tree to climb. It was a huge pine out towards the middle of the woods. The branches at the bottom were low enough that we could grab on and pull ourselves up, and the branches leading up were all very strong. We could climb really high and see a view from above most of the other trees. Sometimes, when I got bored at home, I'd go out there by myself. I'd climb real high in that tree and just think about stuff. I loved being way up there. It was so peaceful and calm. One Sunday, I decided to go on a solo mission in the evening. I knew I didn't have long before dark, so I hurried into the woods to get a climb in. I was up in my spot in no time. I remember it was late in summer, 
The weather was still warm late into the evening. I wanted to be able to see a bit of the sunset, and then I'd get down and hurry home. I just sat up there and daydreamed as I waited for the sunset to begin. Then, I heard a twig snap on the ground, and I looked straight down. I saw a man standing at the base of the tree, looking right up at me. I remember he was wearing a filthy brown jacket, and he had a patchy beard. His hair was sticking up at random places. It looked like he had been relentlessly running his fingers through it. He was just staring at me with a bizarre expression that seemed to be one of wonder and delight. It was an extremely unnerving look. Almost a look of someone that just realized they stumbled across the gold at the end of a rainbow. That's the only way I can describe it. It made my blood run cold. I went completely numb. It was like ice had just been injected into my veins. I don't know how long he'd been watching me before I noticed him, and thinking about that still makes me shiver. We just stared at each other for a moment. He didn't say anything, and neither did I. It sounds strange, but I didn't want to scream or tell him to go away, because I had this gut feeling that told me not to provoke him in any way. After a few minutes, he said, Are you coming down anytime soon? I shook my head back and forth. I didn't know what to say to him. It was clear I was very uncomfortable at this point, and that should be enough to make a decent person go away, but he only grinned at me. Then, he reached his hand up and grabbed the bottom branch of the tree, as if to test it to see if he could hold on. I do believe he may have been planning to climb up to get me, but the lowest branch was flimsy. It was not strong enough to hold a grown adult, and I thank God for that. He soon realized this and gave up, but I had already seen enough. I finally broke my silence and started to yell for someone to help me. I kept screaming and screaming. The man backed away a step or two from the tree and began to mumble and curse under his breath. He flailed his arms in the air in a rage and began making a motion like he was pushing an invisible person in front of him. Eventually, he turned and walked away, sort of stumbling with each step. I don't think anybody heard my cries because nobody came to help me. I stayed up in that tree for what felt like hours because I wasn't sure if he was really gone. Finally I climbed down because the sun was beginning to set and I couldn't bear to be out there at night. I hit the ground and bolted back to my house, positive that he would pop out from a shadow and grab me. He never did. I made it home and told my parents. My dad went out to look in the woods, but he never saw anybody. We stayed in that house for about another two years before we moved across town to a bigger house. I never played in those woods again for the rest of our time there. I still think about that man sometimes. What would he have done if I would have come down? I have no idea, but that question does keep me up some nights. I'm a male, and this happened to me about 10 years ago. So at this time, I'm 14, and I'm enrolled in high school. My mom worked at a nearby apartment complex as a manager, so she'd pick me up from school at 2.40 and bring me home instead of riding the bus for hours. The day is completely normal for me so far. She picks me up from school and brings me home. No more than 10 minutes after I'm home, a black car pulls up in the driveway, and I hear a knock on the door. I look through the glass on the front door. I can clearly see a man wearing a hoodie in the summer, laying on the ground in front of my door. I guess he assumed he was completely obscured, because my mom had a wreath on the door, and the space between the window and the bottom of the door was wide enough that someone could probably assume I couldn't see them. Well, I saw him. I ran and grabbed the house phone and called the police from the kitchen where I could see the car. I had a machete and waited around the corner of the door while still on the phone with the police. At this point, the man knocks again, so I took matters into my own hands. I yelled as loud as I could, leave now or I'll kill you. I had a pretty deep voice for my age, so I guess he thought I was a full grown man. The man got up and hauled ass like an Olympic sprinter. So about three minutes or so pass and the police get to my house. 
We had no cameras or anything, so there's really nothing to go off of to pursue this person. The cops pretty much tell me that I handled the situation well, and then explain the laws about self-defense. The man never returned, and that's the end of my story. I've looked back on this a lot over the years, and this man almost certainly wanted to rob us. What's most creepy about this to me is that he most likely scoped us out, saw that we were just a teenage boy and a single mother, went through the trouble of learning our routines, and waited for what he thought was the ideal moment to rob us. We bought a handgun because of this, so I never really lost any sleep over this, because I knew if he came back, I had a surprise for him too. This happened to me in the summer of 2015. I was dating a guy who lived in the city, and I was living at home at the time in the suburbs. Neither of us had a car, and since I lived at home with my bedroom right next to my grandma's, I always went to him. I take the subway to his place every week and stay for the couple of days I had off from work. To get to his apartment required taking two trains. One day I was headed to see him. It was super hot out and I was wearing a skirt with straps, a crop top, and knee-high socks. I wanted to look cute. I guess I feel this is important as I probably stood out in this outfit, and unfortunately, I probably should have been more careful about what I was wearing. Which sucks. Anyway, I'm on the first train, and after a few stops, I notice a man get on. I couldn't help but notice him as he chose to stand right in front of where I was sitting and stared at me, rather than take an empty seat. It made me feel weird. The man in general gave me a very creepy vibe. He was probably in his 40s, looked unkempt, but otherwise kind of a basic looking guy, and I can't even picture his face. So I get off at the last stop and head through the station to where I need to catch the second train. But I noticed this guy was following me, which I figured at first wasn't a big deal. He could have just been going to the same place. So to get to the platform, I needed to be where you have to go up some stairs, and then I realized he was right behind me. I decided to turn around and go to a different platform, which happened to be packed with people, thinking if he follows me, then this is bad, but maybe I can lose him in the crowd. He follows me, and I try to duck out a few before going back to the actual platform that I needed to be on. I get there, and for a few minutes I feel better until I see him again. He must have known I'd be there after I'd gone up there and turned around. Plus, it was the only other platform, and he most likely saw me the whole time. There weren't too many people waiting compared to the other side, but a few trains came in that was so full, I didn't even bother to try to get on, and neither did he. The whole time I'm texting my boyfriend, who's not taking me seriously at all, I asked if he could at least meet me at the station when I got off which was a five-minute walk from his apartment. He was reluctant, but finally agreed. At this point, I'm still waiting for the train. One comes, but it's very full. I'm getting restless and want to get to a safe place, so I squeeze on, and so does the man right next to me, with his arm over me. I decide that even with all these people around, I am not safe. So right before the doors close, I hop out and the train leaves with the guy staring at me as it pulled away. I waited for a few more trains to come and go, worried the guy would be waiting for me at the next stop or something. I finally got on a train, paying attention to everyone who got on at each stop. He never did. I made it to my stop, greeted by my boyfriend, who seemed put out by having to walk over. He's an ex-boyfriend now, and was generally kind of shitty. I am really proud of myself for getting off the train at the last second. I don't know how much danger I was in, but I know that man was following me, and it definitely wasn't for any wholesome reason. And despite being in public, I feel like if he had tried anything, no one would have done anything. And that's scary because I am very small, and I am not a strong person.
A few months ago, I was at the local coin laundromat. I went late because I had been studying at around 10pm. The laundromat is pretty small, closer to the edge of the beach town I live in. The town is pretty well known for drifters and people experiencing homelessness. Most people are friendly, and there is a lot of drug use, but I've never really felt scared. Everything was fine until I went to move my laundry to a dryer. I was listening to music on my headphones, but it wasn't too loud. Suddenly, I just got this feeling that someone was watching me. I can't really explain it. I just felt the presence. I turned around and there was a man just standing there a few feet away from me. He was a white guy with pink hair wearing a full face mask, like a ski mask, a hoodie, gloves and sunglasses, even though it was dark out. The gloves and sunglasses especially immediately made me feel uncomfortable. I thought maybe he was a drifter or high, but I didn't want to be rude. I tried to laugh it off and told him he surprised me. He immediately started talking. A lot of it was disjointed and just didn't make any sense. He was talking about coming up from Brazil to bring his brother money to get a classic car. None of it made much sense, but he would ask me questions and wait for me to respond, so I tried to play along. I still thought he was probably just high or something, but he was standing between me and the only door. I started getting this gut feeling that he was blocking the door on purpose that it just wasn't an accident as he talked to me. He was getting closer to me as he talked, and the feeling got stronger. Logically, something was off, but mostly, I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that I needed to leave. I needed to keep him talking until I could. I started to edge to the side, but he stayed in front of me. The feeling got more intense. I put my keys in the grip position just in case. He talked more and then backed off a bit. He then took off his backpack. It was a child's unicorn backpack. He had set it on a nearby dryer. I looked over to the door just for a second, and when I looked back, he was pulling something I couldn't see out and holding it to the side of him. It was just behind him where I couldn't see it, but I did get a glimpse of what was in his backpack. Duct tape. Instantly, it was just like an alarm went off. There was no more worrying about being rude, no more second-guessing myself that he was just off but harmless. It was like this cold, numb feeling of dread washed over me. I almost felt calm, like I knew the next few steps. I knew I had to do something. Time seemed to move in slow motion, and he turned back to me, not saying anything anymore, and took a step forward. I gripped my keys as tightly as possible and tried to mentally prepare myself for a fight. I remember being afraid that I would move too slow or be too weak, something like in a nightmare. But all of a sudden the door to the laundromat opened, and a woman walked in, barely even looking at us as she went to get her laundry. It was like a scene in a movie, a moment of intensity, just interrupted by something innocuous and suddenly it's over. He just turned got his bag and left. I was so scared I just stayed there frozen for a minute until I could gather my laundry and just go home. I didn't report it. I never knew what to say. Nothing actually happened, but when I think about it, I think the scariest thing about this is that he left as soon as someone walked in. If he was just crazy, it wouldn't have mattered. I think a stranger's laundry timer saved me from something terrible. I don't go back to the laundromat anymore. I joined a laundry service. The extra cost is worth it to never go back. My boyfriend, our husky and I, embarked upon our long holiday road trip to see our families earlier today. Fourteen hours of this trip takes place on a major U.S. interstate highway. We were looking for places to make our last gas stop and found a place just off the highway. We pulled off and into the desolate gas station. We were immediately greeted by a fairly large, somewhat sketchy man, taking not-so-subtle glances in our direction. We both were joking that maybe we chose the wrong gas station, and boy, did we. My boyfriend suggested while he pumped the gas and run to the restroom, 
I take our dog and let him stretch his legs. Being a city girl, I know to always carry my Mason phone, especially at night. We diverged as I started to make my way towards the ill-lit side of the gas station and my boyfriend to the restroom. I made it not 30 feet from my car and I was approached by a small chihuahua mutt with a collar. The dog happily greeted our husky. I looked around for an owner while the two dogs got to know one another, and I continued to walk to a patch of grass with our new follower in tow. My first instinct was to help the dog find his owner, but in the back of my mind, something felt very off. And to be honest, it felt off since the moment we pulled in. I immediately called my boyfriend and told him I had found a dog and said, Hey, I found a dog, but something is weird. He immediately abandoned his bathroom break and came out to meet me. While I'm standing there with our dog, and this dog who seemingly came out of nowhere, I felt eyes on me from the employees working outside. My boyfriend expressed concern about the dog being loose so close to a major highway, and he further looked around for its possible owner. He approached one of the employees who was changing out trash liners right next to our car for some time now. He asked the employee if he had any idea whose dog this was. In perfect English, he replied, I don't speak English. And he anxiously turned around, only to continue to go through the motions of changing out a trash liner that he'd been standing at this whole time. He then continued to watch us chase around this dog until the dog led us behind the gas station. With my boyfriend five feet behind me, I followed the dog to the back of the store. Behind the store, ten or so big rig trucks sat largely in darkness, resting for the night. Cardboard boxes and broken wooden pallets covered the dirt. A large man in a gas station uniform greeted me staring through a glass door. With my boyfriend out of view, I bent down to check the dog's tags as the man continued to stare. My boyfriend approached, and that's when the man behind the glass door's demeanor changed. Almost dejectedly, he opened the glass door. I quickly asked, Do you know whose dog this is? Nervously, he fumbled his words and replied, Yeah, that's my dog. Me and my boyfriend exhaled and exchanged a look as if to say, Something about that was really weird. We made our way back to the car and my boyfriend remembered he still had to use the bathroom, so I settled back into our locked car. When my boyfriend got back to the car, he told me the same man we had talked to at the back of the store followed him into the bathroom. He stood behind him, watching, and that's when we realized just how creepy and surreal the last 15 minutes had been. As we drove away, we discussed the strange and creepy series of events, how the whole thing felt staged or set up, why did the employee act like he didn't know the dog when it belonged to his co-worker? We immediately googled the small town we had stopped in. We discovered it has been a hotspot for human trafficking, and in recent months, 60 people were arrested. Was this just a string of eerie coincidences, or was there something more sinister going on here? This happened back in early 2015. At that time, I was a 19-year-old guy living in a rather bad area of Portland, Oregon. Even though there were occasionally some belligerent homeless people and drug addicts, violent muggings were very rare, and most of the city felt very safe, even at night. One of my best friends turned 21, and we decided to go bar hopping and then go clubbing. I was in a group of about a dozen people, and three of which were my roommates. Unfortunately for me, I was the only one in my group who was either under the legal drinking age or did not have a fake ID card. This meant I was unable to enter the bar. However, to my luck, there was a nice Mediterranean restaurant right across the street from the bar, which I ended up going to. I stayed there for more than an hour, and then I was ready to leave. I've done that walk many times, even at night, so I was never scared. That was until this night, of course. From my apartment, my roommates took an Uber to the bar. This meant I would have to walk back since I didn't have an Uber, and my phone battery was running low. The distance back to my apartment was about three miles. The time was already close to midnight, and I would be reaching my apartment at around 1am. 
I decided to walk the distance anyway since I haven't been at the gym and I thought this would be good exercise. I began my walk and passed by a lot of drunks. Even though some of the drunks would shout things at me, I never felt unsafe or threatened by them, so I was okay. However, the last mile to my apartment was through a darkly lit park that can be scary at night. Not because of any crime, but because there's only one streetlight in that stretch of road. I reached this somewhat creepy area at around 12.30. As I descend down the dark and narrow street, I notice a black Chevy Silverado speed past me and then slow down once it passes me. The truck almost comes to a stop, but then decides to drive ahead. I begin to shrug it off at first. However, this is where things start to get creepy. After I walk nearly a quarter of a mile forwards, the Chevy Silverado comes down the opposite direction and then proceeds to do the same thing. When the truck slows down and almost comes to a halt, I begin to panic but not openly show it. I pretend to ignore the vehicle, but my instincts tell me that something's not right. The truck then starts to proceed, but this time, I cannot keep myself calm. I was in the middle of the dark and isolated park with no street lights, and there likely won't be a single person in sight. After I walk about 500 feet more, I begin to look in horror as the same pickup truck flies towards me and then suddenly comes to a sudden break about 100 feet behind me. One man, around twice my age and bald, opens the passenger door and comes out of his truck, carrying what looked like a hockey club. I look behind and lock eye contact with him. He gives me the most haunting and sinister look I've ever seen from a real person. He begins to yell, Get out of my sight or I'll mess you up, followed with a racial slur. I'm of Indian origin and have brown skin. It was clear the slur was directed towards me. As I was planning my escape, I remember how there was a wooded area between the park and my apartment. Where I was, I can cut across the park and go through some woods, and then right across the woods was my apartment. This was smart because I have taken that shortcut during the day, and the truck wouldn't be able to cut through the woods. Just as I ran towards those woods, I heard another yelling in the distance. Fuck off, asshole, yelled another large guy walking on the opposite direction of the sidewalk I was on. I then see another large man walking his German Shepherd towards me. After that, the truck driver then started running at us with his hockey club, and I made a run for it. I darted towards the woods. Fortunately, the truck driver decides not to chase us and gets back in his truck. I reached my apartment five minutes later. At the parking lot of my apartment, I happened to see the guy walking his dog. He looked like a roughed up bodybuilder, so I was also a bit afraid of him too. However, we had a pleasant conversation. I begin to head up to my apartment and look out my window. To my disgust and horror, I see the black Chevy Silverado drive by my apartment and then leave. My friends came back home close to 3 in the morning just after I went to bed. Thankfully, I never saw that creep again. I moved out of that apartment a few months later. After this incident, I avoid walking alone in dark spots and isolated areas at night. I was about 15 or 16 at the time. It was my best friend's birthday, and she had invited about six of us over to her place for a few games. Mario Party, Mario Kart, and Guitar Hero. That kind of thing. And she wanted us to stay the night in celebration of her big 16. So at this get-together, there were five girls, including me, and one boy. After a while, my best friend asked if we would like to go to the playground which was about a 10 minute walk away from her house. Of course, being the stupid teens we were, we agreed, not thinking of how it might be dangerous since the majority of us were young girls, and it was currently 10 p.m. Anyways, we walked down to this park and continued playing grounders when we arrived, which if you don't know, is a game commonly played in elementary schools. The rules are, one person is it, the person who is it must close their eyes and try to seek the other players as they hide on the playground equipment in order to tag them. But there's a catch. If someone gets off the equipment and the person who's it calls grounders while they're on the ground, 
They are then tagged. So yeah, I know it's a pretty childish game, but it's fun. After a few rounds, we got bored, and we decided to huddle around in a circle in the center of the playground equipment. We were just talking, joking around when suddenly I heard what I thought to be something like rocks, hitting the chain link fence that resided on the back of the playground. I hushed the group. I looked over at my best friend, asking if she heard that, as everyone looked at me like I had ten heads. She asked what I meant. And when I told her it sounded like someone was throwing rocks at the fence behind us, she responded with the classical, Oh, it's a murderer coming to get us. Naturally, I glared at her, flipping her off. She knows I get paranoid sometimes, but I have very good intuition, and something just felt off. A few minutes later, after some more rocks were thrown at the fence, and I obsessively stared down the area behind the fence in paranoia, I noticed a light weaving its way through the branches of trees. At first, I thought that maybe it was just the headlight of the car that was coming down the street by the park, since you can vaguely see the headlights of oncoming traffic through them. But I soon realized there was only one light, and it was bouncing up and down like it was being held by someone who was walking. I quickly informed the group around me, as we all snapped our heads over in the direction. Coming up along the side of the nearby house on the left side of the park was a man who wore a hat, some white baggy and dirty sweatpants, and a black coat. He was holding a flashlight, not the one on your phone, but an actual flashlight. He was too far away to guess his age, even when he sat on the swings closer to the playground equipment we were on, but we all collectively agreed it was strange since he seemed to be at least in his mid-twenties and just came out of the woods by himself to sit and stare at a load of kids. After a brief discussion, we agreed that maybe he was waiting for a ride, or maybe he was just resting for a moment, so we tried to brush off the fact that he was sitting and staring so intently at us. However, we started to take note that after a few minutes of us resuming our very competitive game of grounds, that this stranger was slowly inching his way closer to our group. He went from sitting on the furthest swing away, to the next swing a bit closer to the equipment we were on, to the next, until he was just about ten feet away from our game. The whole time he just sat there, watching. At this point, all of us have noticed a strange man attempting to get closer to us, and in an attempt to remove ourselves from a potentially dangerous situation, we made a group decision to leave. Getting up, we all piled off the playground equipment, and in pairs of two, we walked down the stairs on the furthest side away from the creepy man. As we attempted to casually walk away, I kept my eyes glued to his figure, and as we neared the end of the street, he got up. Slowly at first, the man started to trail behind us, keeping his distance. I decided to keep my mouth shut at the time, because we were about to make a turn. I thought that if he continues to follow us instead of going the other way, I would bring it up to the others. And wouldn't you know it, the creep stays hot on our heels, not only following which turn we took, but he also starts sprinting towards us, screaming, I'll kill you. At this point, the whole group bursts out into a sprint. The adrenaline I felt made me run so fast I was ahead of everyone else. Everyone else was ushering each other to run. I didn't even take a second to see if the others were behind me. That was until I heard my best friend struggling to run. She had pretty bad asthma. I instead felt horrible for running off on her, so I ran back by her side, grabbing her, and quite literally dragging her along, repeating things to her like, Deep breaths, you got this. Come on, we have to go now. This whole time, the man was still running and screaming behind us, and he was quickly catching up. At this point, both me and another girl in the group took it upon ourselves to get my best friend moving as fast as possible both taking a hand and running at a pace she could keep. Luckily, this park was about a ten-minute walk from my best friend's house, and as we piled in through her garage door, I turned to see this delusional man running up her driveway. He got about halfway until our big fluffy savior ran to the door, my friend's a hundred-pound, fully-grown German shepherd. She lurched at the man, barking as we gripped her collar, in an attempt to keep her from running completely after the man. Luckily, her sudden and loud appearance caused the man to freeze in fear. He turned away, running down the dark lamplit street. 
We were terrified for the rest of the night, and only managed to sleep after putting random items next to us. But what was most comforting was our big fluffy hero, just in case that creep decided to come back, slept with us. Hi, I am a 21 year old female with a whole bunch of baggage. I've struggled with my mental health my entire life, and last year I was admitted to an acute psychiatric hospital. I have only recently been discharged. Without blogging about my life, I went through some tough, dark times. Luckily I managed to get out after seven admissions. I'm ready to re-enter the world. Anyways, my final admission was to a ward I'd been to a couple of times before. I knew the staff and many of the patients. Sure, it was difficult and tumultuous at times, but most people strive to make it as bearable as possible. The daily routine, at least in UK psych wards, is usually the same. Wake up, take meds, eat food, watch TV, take meds, eat food, take an optional nap, eat more food, take meds, and then go to sleep. You get the gist. It's boring as hell. So one day, I came back to my room just after breakfast to see Karen. She was the usual ward cleaner. She was standing in my room, staring out of my window, looking fairly startled. Now, when you work as a cleaner on a psych ward, you see some shit, so I knew something was up. I said, uh, hey Karen, what's going on? She explained that while she was cleaning my room, she had seen a thin middle-aged man, wearing sunglasses and carrying a backpack, walk past the room a couple of times. She said that something seemed off about him. I sort of shrugged it off because he may have well just been a lost patient, as they usually look off. So I went about my day as usual. Then, at around midday, I went to grab something from my window shelf, and was face to face with this middle-aged man wearing sunglasses, and yeah, a backpack. He didn't look especially freaky, just normal, lanky looking. Still, I freaked out and ran from the room. The windows were tinted, so I'm fairly sure he couldn't have seen me, but it still gave me quite a fright. During the next few days, a number of patients and staff members saw him walk past numerous windows, which was especially strange because the ward was fenced off, so your average bystander wouldn't or couldn't find themselves near the unit. We all wondered whether he was just a curious adventurer, or if it was something a bit more sinister. Three days after the initial encounter, I had forgotten all about the whole thing. I went to bed with my window slightly cracked. I'm aware I might have imagined this, but I swear that at around 1am I woke up and heard something tap on my window. I tried to look through the window, but it was dark, so all I could see was my own reflection. I freaked out, shut the window, and then told the night staff what was up. That morning, numerous patients were complaining of weird noises during the night, and that included tapping and sometimes heavy breathing. One girl even swore she heard someone try to open her window further. Anyway, security was up for the next few days, and we never saw him again. While we were in graduate school, my husband and I lived in student housing in a large apartment complex. To get to the complex, you needed a key, and you also needed a key to access the stairwell. We were up on the third floor and had a balcony that we shared with our next door neighbors. Because it was a small balcony and not very practical to hang out on, we all primarily used it to store odd items, such as bikes. One night around midnight, my husband and I heard an odd clanging noise coming from outside. We ignored it at first, because hey, we live in a big complex in a busy area of town. Noises happen. However, the noise continued, and eventually my husband decided he should get out of bed and check it out. He opened the door to the balcony and the noise stopped. He stepped out and looked around, noticing nothing amiss. And as he started to go back inside, he happened to glance down at the floor of the balcony and noticed two fingers wrapped around the lower railing. 
He did a double take and then peered over the edge to see a man dressed in all black, wearing a ski mask and a backpack. It had a baseball bat sticking out of it. He was hanging off of our third floor railing. Apparently my husband's fight or flight reflex is to be a bit defective because his immediate reaction was to say, Hey, what the hell are you doing? And apparently the ski mask guy's ninja balcony climbing skills did not transfer into coming up with a credible story, because he replied with, Uh, nothing? At this point, my husband snapped back into common sense mode, and started yelling for someone to call the police. The ski mask guy went all parkour style at this point, dropping from balcony to balcony, landing on the ground, then somehow hurtling himself over an 8-foot cinder block wall that surrounded the complex with lightning speed. The police came out, looked around, and found nothing. It wasn't until the next day that we discovered our next door neighbor's bike had vanished the night before. Not only had the ski mask guy managed to scale up two floors of balconies, but he'd actually gotten onto our balcony and gotten the bike off of it and down to the ground. He didn't take it with him when he left, but it also wasn't there when the cops looked around, and that suggests he wasn't alone that night. Security cameras were installed at the complex within the next week. There were no other incidents, but I always wonder what would have happened if my husband had gone out in the balcony just a bit earlier, when the intruder and his bat was still on it. I work at a grocery store and we close at 12. I usually get the closing shift and someone leaves around 11.30, leaving just me and the manager. I'm working with my friend Carol, who is a really petite girl. She's about 5 foot and probably about 90 pounds. At about 11 p.m., two drunk guys come in with weird accents and start talking to her. I was on register and barely heard their conversation, but I heard one of them asking when she gets off. A little bit after talking to her some more, I see them get visibly frustrated and leave. We thought nothing of it. We deal with a lot of drunks and angry people all the time, so it was nothing out of the ordinary. Eventually, it was around 11.30, so she clocked out but had some shopping to do, which she finished around 11.50. I told her she might as well wait for us to clock out, because it'll only be 10 minutes anyway. I should mention now that I've been called intimidating numerous times. Mostly because I have really broad shoulders, which makes me look bigger than I am. And I have a constant bitch face, which makes me look pissed off all the time. Also, my manager is pretty intimidating. He's a pretty big guy. He kind of looks like Brock Lesnar if he grew his hair out and gained a couple of pounds. So a pretty burly, intimidating looking guy. Anyway, we all walk out together, just talking shit to each other. When we see two guys run from out of the corner straight to their truck. One guy was holding what looked like to be a bat, and the other guy had some sort of towel. My manager took out a phone and got a picture of the license plate before they drove away. Carol realized right away it was the guys that were talking to her. This is when she had explained to us that they kept asking when she was off and if she was free. She slipped up and said she didn't have a boyfriend, so they most likely waited outside the entire time for her to come out but they must have got scared when they saw two other scary looking guys with her. It's crazy to think that if she would have left when she was planning to, she could have been seriously hurt or even worse. So I lived alone in a bad neighborhood just outside of the city. At this point, I'd been living there for maybe three years with no incident. Well, I mean there were several shootings on my street, but no one shot at me. No incident, I guess. I'm the kind of person who can't sit still for very long, so I find myself standing or pacing a lot. On this particular night, maybe at about 2am, I was pacing while reading a textbook to prepare for an upcoming test at my university. I stopped pacing for a bit and just stood near my front door to read. That's when I heard my door knock turn. For some reason, though, I nearly shit myself. I was able to calmly look down at my deadbolt to double-check if it was locked. It was. I looked through the people to see who was trying to come in, but no one was standing there. 
This was very confusing. I am not superstitious nor a believer in the supernatural, but I am also stupid. So my first thought was, is a ghost trying to break into my house? Thankfully that thought gave way to a more logical thought of, maybe they're going around back. So I quickly moved to the back door to make sure it was locked. And it was, but then my front doorknob turned again. I tiptoe ran to the front door. At this point my heart is pounding. My dog, who is a big protective teddy bear, is now looking at me with major concern in his eyes. I look through the peephole again, but there is still no one there, and that's when I hear a small knock on my door. As I'm looking through the peephole, then a small child's voice said, Let me in. And then there was silence. And once more, Let me in. I am still looking through the peephole. I had my hand covering my mouth to make my breathing quieter. Through the people, I see a small three-year-oldish girl walk to the edge of my porch, and then she looked into my bushes. She nods and then says, Okay, in what I think was supposed to be a whisper. She walks closer to the door again, and I lose sight of her in the people. She tries the handle once more and then says, Please help me. My uncle is a cop. So I had heard about people using children as a way to get people to open their door, right before a blitz attack, so I'm pretty sure that's what was happening at this point. I wasn't sure how to handle the situation, so I just said, and not even into a phone, Hi, hello? I think someone is trying to break into my apartment. Yeah, my address is 1234 Lowell Street. Yeah, I'll stay on the line. And that's when I saw a shadow emerge from my bushes. Thankfully, they picked the kid up and ran away. It was two people and the kid. This summer, I decided to pick up some graveyard shifts at my current full-time job, simply because it pays more, and I'm a university student drowning in student debt. About two weeks ago, on the rare occasion that I get to sleep during the time the sun is down, at 3.30 to 4 a.m., I was suddenly awoken by a loud sound. Me, being half asleep, I honestly didn't know exactly what the sound was, so I just chalked it up as my neighbors dropping something, because I live in an apartment with very thin walls. So I just try going back to sleep. After about 10 minutes of laying there with my eyes closed, I hear the sound again. But this time, I'm pretty much awake, so I recognize what the sound is immediately. Someone was knocking on my window. For a bit of context, I'm a single female living alone in a basement suite, so my windows are basically level with the sidewalk. Anyways, obviously I'm freaked out. I don't know what the hell to do. I didn't want to move and make any loud noises so they know I'm home. I'm just frozen in my bed, and then I hear the knocking again. I instantly bolt up as my fight or flight kicks in and I run to the front door which has my keys with my pepper spray on it. The keys clink together and make a noticeable noise, and then the knocking starts to get more intense and loud. This is when I realize that the window with the screen by my bed is almost all the way open, because my cat likes to sit on the edge and I forget to close and lock it. I start to freak out after having major anxiety. I start looking for my phone just in case I need to call the police. Me, being clumsy and shaking from anxiety, I drop the phone on the ground, and whoever is at my window proceeds to what sounds like either slide his fingernails or a sharp object down the screen. I realize this person's intentions are either to come in or scare me, so like an idiot and not thinking, I run to the window as fast as I can and slam it shut. I lock it while avoiding looking outside at whoever it was. The knocking stops and I wait about 30 minutes without hearing anything more. I lay back down and go right back to sleep. The next morning, I honestly couldn't believe that even happened to me. I start to think maybe it was a dream, so I go outside and investigate. I see an empty beer bottle and a ripped blanket. I text my only friend who knows where I live and ask them if they're messing with me. They say no, which I pretty much figured, because they don't drive and they live quite far off, and the buses around my house stopped running well before 3am. So I called my landlord and told him what happened. He said to ignore it and it happened before. And that is really creepy. Anyways, 
I obviously recognize now I should have done a lot of things differently. I should have called the police right away. It hasn't happened since. Nonetheless, it's still terrifying, but I can't afford to move again. About eight years ago, two buddies and I decided to spend the night camping at Palo Duro Canyon. We're from Amarillo, Texas, so it's less than 20 miles away. This is the second largest canyon in the US next to the Grand Canyon. And while you may be wondering what kind of spooky shit we may have run into as young kids of just 17 years of age, this isn't necessarily that kind of story. Instead, us three friends were some of the only around our age that we knew that didn't indulge in partying. No drinking or getting stoned. Nothing of that nature. So of course we think a perfect getaway on a Friday night would be the canyon. We didn't even own camping supplies. We just went to Walmart and bought some and headed out on a whim. We make the drive and get to the state park around 5pm. We enter the gate and set off to find a spot to pitch a few tents. We pull into this campsite area that has two separate canopies with picnic tables and respective grills for cooking. In the middle of both canopies, a fire pit. Nobody was there, so we thought it was a perfect place to set up camp. We bought some coolers with soda, some hot dogs and hamburgers to grill, and a stereo to jam some tunes while we hung out and enjoyed the last few hours of daylight in the Texas summer heat. After we pitched our tents, a truck with a small camper RV moseyed on into the side. A man and a woman got out and surveyed the area. The man saw us and waved, with that friendly Texan hospitality. We waved back, of course, and went about our business. We ate dinner and the sun was starting to set. I noticed that the man and woman didn't pitch a tent, and that they probably just intended on staying in their camper. We built a fire and sat around it in some portable chairs we bought, and I saw the man walking towards us. He introduced himself as Doug. He said that he cooked a lot of extra food if we wanted any. We politely declined and told him we already ate, but we appreciated the offer. He said, Hey, as long as you guys have eaten, it's no big deal. He waved again and went back off to his camp. About an hour later, he comes back with a brown paper bag and comments on the music we were listening to. Says how back in the 70s he went to all these festivals and basically just rambles on about how awesome that we were so young and still keeping classic rock alive. He notices that my friends have guitars and actually yells over to his wife to come on over. By this point, we didn't think anything weird of it. We just didn't know him or his wife and he was obviously drinking and just invited themselves into our space. None of us had the spine to say anything to him about it, so we all just sat around the fire trading stories. Well, as much as three 17-year-old boys can, with a couple who were probably in their late 50s. After what seemed like a lifetime of bullshitting stories with these people we didn't know, he starts to get to know us on a more personal level. He was polite, but obviously a bit drunk. He asks if we have jobs or if we're in school, and we all reply. He says that he works at the United Supermarket as a stalker, and he's been doing that for the last 15 years. He basically says that if any of us need a job at any time, if we put him as a reference, he could get us on. He says his full name for us to reference, just in case one of us wants to apply. Anyways, finally the wife starts nodding off, all liquored and bundled up. She fell asleep in her chair. Luckily, that was the cue for Doug to get her back to the camp and put her to bed. When they walk off back to their side, the three of us look at each other and eye roll, because we were all such doormats and basically let strangers come and ruin our night. We see that it's close to midnight, so we decide to put the fire out and get ready for bed. Doug trots back over to our side. He asks us if we're here all weekend or not. We told him we only had enough money to stay for one night and that we'd be heading back to town in the morning. He said he really enjoyed the company, and that he'd personally pay for us to stay another night if we wanted to. We politely declined his offer, and he started back off to his RV. He quickly turns back around, and he says, Remember guys, if any of you need a job at all, just call up United on Gem Lake Road, 
and tell them Doug Grantham sent you. We smiled and said thanks, and he left for good that time. That night actually got considerably cold, and we decided to pack up and head back to our warm beds in town at around 4am. As we were leaving the canyon, we almost hit a deer and veered off the road. Everyone was okay, but we were definitely shocked because it was so late, and we'd gotten no sleep at that point. Us almost hitting the deer was practically the climax of our trip to the canyon that weekend, and we all continued back to school on Monday like normal. One of my friends that was with me on the camping trip was actually in my third period class on Monday. We started talking about the guy Doug and his wife were pretty cool, despite not taking the hint that we didn't care to hang out with them. I asked my buddy if he could remember Doug's last name, and somehow he did, so I googled him. Mistake. Guess who was a ten times over registered sex offender? You guessed it. Doug. This rocked our world. We had somehow, some way, just barely escaped the clutches of this man. What would have happened to us if we took his offer to stay another night? I was so suspicious of this guy, and I couldn't get the scenario off my mind. I decided to call the United Supermarket to tell the manager that one of his employees was really creepy to us, and that he might want to be weary of the people he hires. And guess what? Nobody by Doug's name has ever worked for United. He bullshit us all night long, trying to get us drunk to do God knows what. So everyone, be careful who you talk to. I'm a female, and when I was 12-ish years old, I was potentially almost kidnapped. I was sitting in my living room, which has a large window facing the main road, when I heard someone knock on the mudroom door. My dad was downstairs playing on his drum set, and it was well into the evening. I thought it was strange, but I figured maybe it was someone who wanted to ask him to play quieter. When I opened the main door, there was a man. He was probably in his 40s or 50s, wearing what looked like casual business clothes. Jeans, black shoes a button-up shirt. I didn't recognize him. I didn't really think much of it, but I kept the screen door closed as a precaution. The creepy guy said to me, Hi, I was wondering if I could use your phone. I need to call someone. Uh, sorry, no, we don't have a landline, and I don't have a cell phone, I said to him. I lied because I had a bad gut feeling. Oh, that's okay. Do you think I could at least have a glass of water? I can wait here while you grab it, he said to me. Sorry, we just moved in and I haven't unpacked our glasses yet. Again, this was a huge lie, but I panicked. Through the window, you could make out we'd lived there for some time. And then he said to me, trying way too hard to be friendly. That's alright. Do you have a hose I could drink from? And at this point, I was freaked out. I said to him, uh, yeah, it's actually right there on the ground, and I pointed to the hose a couple feet from the door. And now, with an even wider smile, he said, oh, thank you, do you think you could turn it on for me? I was terrified, and I lied again. Uh, sorry, no, I don't know how it works. A crack started to form, and he was a bit angry, but he was trying his best to hide it. He then said to me, Oh, come on. How do you not know how to use a hose? At this point, my fight or flight was in full force, so I slammed the door, locked it, and ran downstairs to my dad. I told him what happened, and he stormed outside with a baseball bat, but the guy was long gone by the time my dad got outside. I never saw him again after that. It still freaks me out to think of what he might have done if he got a hold of me. So I work late a lot, and tonight, as I was coming around the corner from where I get off at my train stop, a guy making a turn at the intersection hollered at me. I made the mistake of saying hi back because I'm a nice person. It's just my natural instinct. I knew I messed up bad when I saw him started making a U-turn, 
so I quickly crossed the street, hoping that since he would be on the other side, I would lose him since it's a really busy street. But I didn't. He made another U-turn at the next light and pulled directly up beside me. I screamed at him to leave me alone and started walking even more quickly. I wasn't running yet because I didn't want him to see I was going to turn to go into my neighborhood. Somehow, he managed to make another super illegal dangerous U-turn, and he ended up directly beside me at the entrance to my block. Luckily he got caught at a red light, and I realized then just how sketchy this was, and how much danger I could possibly be in. I started sprinting as fast as I could just hoping and praying I could make it to my house and to safety before that light turned green and he was after me again. Thank God there were some guys outside the apartment complex next to my street. When they saw me running, I told them someone was following me. They stepped to the sidewalk and started looking down from where he was turning from, scaring him into pulling into a parking lot adjacent to where I was heading, instead of still following me into a now much darker and less populated area. I made it inside and started crying. And not a minute later, I see headlights past my front windows. I look out and it's the same car, on my street, driving past my home. He must have pulled out of the parking lot and proceeded into the same direction I was obviously going, hoping to catch me before I made it home. No one I live with is validating how serious and scary this was. I live in a major city. The street he followed me on for the majority of this time is incredibly busy and well lit bars everywhere. It's Friday night, he didn't care. He could tell I was a young woman alone at night and headed home, and he planned on following me all the way there. I may have made it home, but he drove on my street. He drove by my house. I don't know when I will feel safe again, and the worst part is I have to work late every day. This is not okay. The world is not safe. I didn't deserve this. Now I get to live in fear as he gets to know where I live. None of this is fair. I live in a town which is quite like a party town, so people come here in the summer to swim in the lake, drink and party a lot. And then as autumn hits, the tourists go home and the town is silent and peaceful again. Last summer, I was in the city center, waiting for my boyfriend to pick me up and go to a trip near the town in the afternoon. I waited in front of a shopping center, so I stood there for about 10 minutes and saw people passing by. All of a sudden, this old man who seemed to be in his 60s approached me. To be honest, my first thought was that he was a homeless person because he had dirty looking clothes and long dry hair. He was wearing jeans and a jacket in the middle of summer and that was a bit of a red flag to me. For a bit about myself, I am 20 years old, tall, a sporty built girl with copper red hair. I can say I'm pretty harsh with beggars and creeps, otherwise you can't get rid of them. So this man stood in front of me, and he asked where some good restaurants were nearby. He spoke in English, so I thought maybe he's not homeless, and I told him nicely about the restaurants. I used to guide tourists, so it wasn't odd to me, but the odd things just happened after this. He thanked me on the recommendations, and I thought he would go on his way, but he stayed. He looked me up and down, and he introduced himself. He told me his name, and that he was from France. He didn't even have a French accent, and then he asked if I was waiting for someone. I thought that it was just some small talk he wanted, so I said yes, I'm waiting for my boyfriend. He seemed a bit pissed after I mentioned my boyfriend, he then asked my name and age. I said I was 16. I just want to say I don't look 20. I wanted to put him off and claim myself as a minor, just in case. He asked me if my boyfriend has a car and what kind of car. I didn't tell him, so I lied again. He then said, how old is he? I lied and said he was 25. I didn't want to be a drama queen, so I stayed calm, but all of my nerves screamed at this point. I looked for some familiar people on the street, but no one was there. Suddenly the man grabbed my hand and held it in his. He asked if I would grab a drink with him. I ripped my hand out of his and told him no. What is he thinking and to piss off? I didn't wait for him to leave. I was the one who left first. 
I began speed walking to the nearest skate park because I knew some of my friends spent a lot of time there and the skate park is also next to the police station. I didn't have the nerve to look behind me so I just walked as fast as possible. I didn't see anyone I knew at the time but I saw these boys who sometimes hung out with my friends and there were also some people who I saw at the high school a few years ago. So I sat on the bench next to some skaters' backpacks and I looked back. The man was on the other side of the street and looked directly at me. The boys at the park approached me because they told me that I'm pale and asked if I was okay. I told them about the man on the other side of the street and when everyone looked at him, he finally left. My boyfriend arrived two minutes later. I told him where I was. He was in a traffic jam so that's why he was late. I don't know who that man was and what would happen if I didn't go to the park. I thought that maybe I overreacted about the whole situation, but I don't know. Something was really not right with the man. Anyways, I will never forget the look on his face while he talked to me. I don't know why. I live in a city with a public transportation system. They have been extremely short-staffed, and more often than not, you have to call to make sure your bus is even coming. On weekdays during business hours, the public transit operator will order a lift for you to get to work if your bus isn't showing up, or if they're short a driver. Tuesday I'm at the bus stop, after checking multiple times if my bus is coming, only to find out it wasn't. They ordered me a lift, and this nice older gentleman was my driver. We had casual conversation, and he started to ask personal questions. I'm a bartender and I'm super friendly already, so I didn't think his questions were ill-intentioned. I told him that I'm not married and pretty much a loner. I basically go to work, go home, and then spend time with family. He then says, I'd marry you in a heartbeat. Again, I'm just thinking he's being funny or nice. I asked him to drop me off at the downtown grocery store so I could pick up some things I needed for work. When we stopped, he said he was joking and that he's married and he has a son my age. He asked if I was maybe interested in meeting him. Since I have a terrible track record, I figured it wouldn't hurt meeting someone out of my circle and comfort zone. So I gave the man my number and we parted ways. The next morning, he messages me and asks if I need a ride to work. I told him he didn't have to do that, and that I was sure my bus was running. He said it would be his pleasure, and he'd pick me up at my house at 3pm. Then about an hour later, he asked if I wanted to have lunch with him before work. I told him I was busy and that I couldn't do that. He then said, Okay, see you at 3. He shows up at 3 and lets me know he's waiting outside. While I'm finishing getting my things together, I open the door and he's starting to walk up my stairs to my house. I told him I was ready and we could head downtown. When I get in the back seat, he turns around and says he has a confession. He told me from the time I took off my mask, his heart danced like a butterfly. He said that he hasn't been able to stop thinking about me since the day before and that he'd love to spend time with me and that he'd pay for my time if I spent the day with him. And that's when I started to feel really uncomfortable. The whole ride was making me cringe, but I know when you're in a situation like that with a predator, playing nice is safer than freaking out. He continued on the entire ride about how he loved me at first sight and wanted to make me his Lebanese queen. As we got closer to downtown, I started to feel relief. He dropped me off at my hotel and said, See you tomorrow. That evening at work, I checked my phone after a busy happy hour. He messaged me a few times. He sent a picture of the hotel I work at, and he said he'd wait for me to get off to give me a ride home. I told him I already had a ride, but thank you anyways. On Thursday morning, I'm out running errands with my mom and sister. He messages me and asks how early he can pick me up, because he can't stop thinking about me. I asked him to please stop and that I was with my family. He continued to text me all day and evening, begging to see me telling me his heart is aching to see his Lebanese queen. I just kept saying, please stop. Friday morning, the shit hit the fan. 
He tells me he loves me no matter what. He said, I told my wife about you and that I'm in love with you. I said I want a divorce. I told him to please not do that, and it wasn't right to treat his wife that way. He said it wasn't my fault, they were drifting apart anyway, and he said I'm picking you up for dinner at 5.30, and I'm not taking no for an answer. I ignored the message during the day and just went about my life. Around 5.25, my video doorbell rings and he's standing on my porch for at least 15 minutes. I told him I wasn't home and that he should leave. He continues to message me and beg to come pick me up from my parents. I was home the whole time, but I was too scared to let him know that. I eventually called the non-emergency police station, but he had already left by the time I got through. I filed a general report, but they can't do anything unless he's standing on my porch threatening me. They advised me to report through Lyft, so I did. I haven't heard anything since then, but all of it was just really creepy. I am a 22-year-old girl from Spain. I'm very used to using public transport to get basically everywhere, and it's not unusual to have some weird or creepy interactions with people. Mostly men who randomly start to tell you about their lives and how sad they are. I usually just nod and politely smile until I can go the other way. I try to be very nice and polite because I'm terrified of offending a crazy guy in case they do something. It had worked every time. However... This encounter in particular left me pretty shaken. I was on the train coming back home, and it was a 40-minute ride. I usually just wear my headphones, but that day I decided I would just spend that time reading some random novel on my phone. It wasn't dark out, so I was fairly calm. The train was mostly empty, except for a guy and a couple behind me, but I didn't pay much attention to any of them, because I get really focused and engrossed when I enjoy a novel. The first five or ten minutes were uneventful, until I saw the guy from before get up and change his seat to one that was oriented towards me. Not immediately in front of me, but maybe two seats ahead of me, looking in my direction. Again, I didn't pay much attention and I kept doing my thing. Then I hear the guy mutter some words. At first, I thought he was talking on the phone or something, but when I looked up, he was looking straight at me. He didn't take his gaze away from me when I made eye contact. It was only then when I realized what he was saying. He was insulting and cursing at me, repeatedly and non-stop, in a very low voice. The insults ranged from bitch, whore, stupid, to much more colorful Spanish insults that I don't even think have a translation. I became paralyzed. Why was this guy cursing at me? I had done nothing to him. I had barely looked at him. I thought maybe I'd pulled a face or something in the beginning, but then I realized I had my mask on, so I couldn't have. I began to panic a bit. I didn't know what to do. It only got worse when the other couple that were on the train got off. So now it was only me and him. I thought about getting off the train too, but we were positioned in a way that made it impossible for me to move anywhere without walking right beside him. I really didn't want to get that close. I decided to ignore him, pretend I wasn't hearing him. I wanted to see if he would get tired and stop, but no, he just kept going. It was the creepiest thing, he was barely stopping to breathe between insults. He just kept going, repeating the same things over and over again in a menacing and threatening tone, with hate in his words and in his eyes, always looking right at me even though I tried my best not to look back, and things just got worse. He started mixing physical threats among his insults. I'm going to kill you. I'm gonna bash your brains in. Things like that. That's when I really started to freak out. Insults were one thing, but I felt this was escalating. I started messaging my friends and my boyfriend, telling them about the situation. My boyfriend tried to call the train security phone, but there wasn't much they could do, and I didn't dare calling them myself because I didn't want the guy to know I was calling for help. I also wanted to cry so badly, but I didn't let myself because I didn't want to encourage him. I didn't want him to see he was having an effect on me. For some reason, he moved. He changed seats to one that was behind me. 
I got off the train at the next station, even though it wasn't my stop, because I didn't want him to know which one was my stop. I kept looking behind me, fearing he would follow me and act on his threats. I didn't see him anymore. One of my friends picked me up in his car and he took me home. The whole ride I was shaking and crying, kind of laughing hysterically because I couldn't understand what just happened, or why. I became paranoid for a while, thinking he would somehow follow me, but I haven't seen him again since then. The worst part is that I was scared of using public transport for a couple of days after that. I was so frustrated that a weirdo could have that effect on me, and that he had done that to someone he didn't even know. I kept thinking what would have happened if I'd been wearing my headphones and didn't realize what he was doing. I would have gotten off my stop like normal. Would he have followed me? The train station where I usually stopped was in a pretty shady area, and I still get creeped out when I think what could have happened if we'd been alone there. I'm even shaking a bit just by thinking about it. When I was six, I went with my mom, uncle, and grandparents to the airport. My grandparents were taking an international flight. This was in the 80s, so this meant we were allowed to walk all the way to the gate and wait with my grandparents, right before they boarded the plane. Times have changed and this is no longer allowed. My mom was sitting with my grandparents having a conversation. My uncle was off getting coffee somewhere, and being the six-year-old I was, I became bored of sitting and started to wander off a bit. My mom called me to her and gave me the stranger danger talk and how I needed to stay with them. My attitude was pretty much a, uh, yeah, whatever. Again, my mom got distracted by my grandparents' questions. I began to wander off again. I peeked my head and looked down the hallway. There were people coming and going, and less than 15 feet away from me, I saw a creepy man. He had long brown hair to his waist, dressed in black leather head to toe, and he had a beard and mustache. He was about to open the door, which I'm assuming now was the bathroom. And as he's opening the door, he looked right at me and waved his finger for me to come there. I immediately thought of the conversation my mom had with me just a few minutes ago. Plus, the guy looked evil, so I immediately turned and ran back to my mom. I said, Guess what, mom? The stranger was trying to take me. You were right. I don't remember her taking me very seriously. She was helping my grandparents with their tickets and wasn't paying much attention. When it was time to leave, and I took a peek down the hall and he was gone. And I still think about it to this day. What would have happened if I went to him? And if my mom didn't talk to me about strangers just a few minutes before, I know that maybe this wouldn't have turned out good. I'm a female, 22. I was getting a train back home, and I was on a pretty quiet platform on a Sunday. I really needed to pee, so I went to the platform bathroom before my train got in. Before this, some guy had been looking at me intensely on the platform, but I didn't think much of it. I did my business and heard the doors open and close multiple times. Before leaving my cubicle, I hear a woman say, Hey, are you okay in there? I was confused. I asked if she was talking to me. As I left the cubicle, she told me that the guide rushed to follow me into the ladies as soon as I wasn't looking. This lady, bless her, followed in after it. She basically scared him away. So thank you to the random lady, and I hope I never meet that creep again. This happened about 15 years ago. I was 6 and my sister was 11. We were camping with our grandparents on a campground we went to often, in a tent trailer we always used. We had been there for a few nights, having no problems at all. If you're not familiar with a tent trailer, the kind my family owned had two queen-sized beds that folded outwards of the trailer and were somewhat suspended, with a tarp overhead that attached to hooks underneath the base of the bed. In the middle of the night, when we were all asleep, a man had come into our campground and 
and hooked some of the tarp under the bed my sister and I were sleeping in, reaching his hand in and started feeling around our bed. I awoke to the feeling of someone touching my hair, assuming it was my sister moving in her sleep or something. But within a few seconds, my sister jerks up. We both realize there's a hand wrapped around her arm and a man whispering, Shh. Hysterical, we both start screaming and my sister started bending his fingers backwards, hoping to hurt him and back off a bit. My grandparents obviously woke up to the screaming, and somehow I managed to tell my grandfather through sobs what was happening. My grandfather furiously ran outside, but found nothing. He only saw the bushes shaking as the man ran away through them. Thank God this was our last night and we were leaving in the morning. Needless to say, we would have left anyway. This just happened to me. I'm walking to my car and a sheriff's car is honking and driving by me. I'm thinking the sheriff needs to enter the driveway of the hotel I'm crossing. So I move out of the way. He motions again, so I cross the driveway and he follows me. Then he motions me over, all while his windows are up. I remove my earbud and start walking closer. He rolls his window down and says, Get in. I question him by saying, What? He says again, Get in the car. There's stuff in the front seat, so the only place to get in is the back. I ask him for his badge number and he rolls up his window, and then he speeds off. It took me a few seconds to realize what happened, and I called Hubster. I am low-key shaken up. That was a predator, and he's using his uniform as a power over women to possibly harm them. I'm upset at myself, because other than seeing things in his car and the fact that he was in a uniform, I can't give details of how he looks. It was all just a blur. I already called the non-emergency number for the police, but obviously they didn't answer. I'll be going in person to make a report. This happened four years back. I was about 14 years old. My parents were out and had left me and my little sister home alone. It was like 10 or 11 at night when the lights went out. This used to happen in my country sometimes since it's a new country and really poor. But that time I noticed something out of the ordinary. Only the lights in our house were out and my neighbor's lights were on. I had a bad feeling so I quickly locked all the doors and closed the blinds. I told my sister to hide behind the couch and not leave no matter what happened. I hid somewhere else with a knife, tried to call my mom but she didn't pick up. So I waited. I thought it was over, so I got out of my hiding place and went to the kitchen, and as I got closer to the window to look out, I hear the back door doorknob turning. It was locked, so the person on the other side tries it again, violently. That's when I panicked and shouted, Who are you? Get away from my house. I have called the police. I hear footsteps and then nothing. I went to the other room and looked out the window, and I caught a glimpse of someone running out of my backyard. My sister was crying, so I had to calm her down while we stayed hidden until my parents came home. We told them everything, and my dad said that whoever it was had intentionally cut the house's electricity to scare us. To this day, every time the electricity goes out, I get kind of scared and terrified. I'm just glad we're okay. This happened in my senior year of college, and I lived off campus. I had two roommates in my apartment, townhouse thing, named Natalie and Katie. Anyway, Katie was out one night doing homework in one of the school buildings. I was woken up at 3am when I heard some knocking at the door downstairs. I thought it was weird, considering the hour, but I figured somebody had the wrong place and would realize, and then leave. The knocking didn't stop, though. I laid in bed for a good several minutes, thinking, yeah, they'll go away now. They'll go away. 
they'll get bored. As one might expect though, I started to grow confused and then freaked out by this person's persistence. Then the knocking turned into banging and I couldn't ignore it anymore. Honestly, I probably should have called the police immediately, but it was the middle of the night and I was just so confused. So I headed to the top of the stairs to see Natalie standing near the door, staring at it. Her room was on the bottom floor, so she had just walked up to it. We exchanged a baffled look, because it's 3am and this is weird. Natalie called out and asked them who they were and what they wanted. We're friends of Katie's, said the voice on the other end, who sounded like a male and about our age. We know her boyfriend and we heard she was feeling down so we came to surprise her. That was already a weird story, because again, it was three o'clock in the morning. But thankfully, Katie wasn't even home, so the two of us informed them of this. Katie's not here, she's off doing something else. Good. They're going to leave, right? They came here to see Katie, and she's not here. They'll leave us alone and we can go back to sleep. Just open the door. I know, I know. If I hadn't called the police before, I definitely should have done it now. It was weird though. That night, I realized why people do stupid stuff in horror films. Not only had I been woken up out of nowhere, but it feels surreal to be in a situation like this. Like there's no way you could actually be in any danger. That only happens in horror movies and true crime documentaries, and in questionable creepy stories online. It would never happen to me. I'm just a random, ordinary, boring person going about my business. I don't need to call the police. I'm sure this will get cleared up and everything will be fine. So yeah, Natalie and I did the stupid thing and tried to argue with them. We told them again, Katie was not here. There was no need for them to stay. Eventually, Natalie asked what their names were. Throughout the encounter, we made out two distinct voices but only one of them gave us a name. I messaged Katie without telling him, asking if she was friends with someone with that name. After a couple of minutes, during which we were still arguing with the stranger, Katie replied, I am, but I don't think she knows where I live. That wasn't good, but even worse, she? The person on the other side of the door had a male voice, so this was a real name, but not the real person. Whoever this was knew stuff about Katie, like who she hung out with. I told Katie to stay where she was and not to come back until we told her everything was okay. Finally, we told the guys that if they didn't leave, we were going to call the police. No, 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 no. Don't call the police. Do not call the police, okay? If we wanted to do something bad, we already would have done it, right? Yeah, that last bit wasn't helping their case. Just open the door, okay? The attempts at reasoning with them basically devolved into them telling us. Just open the door over and over again, until we actually did call the police. We hid in Natalie's room and dialed 911. We explained what was going on. Thankfully, there was a police station close by, so it wouldn't take long for them to arrive. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of heading back into the living room and yelling through the door that we called the cops. But contrary to what you might think, that actually didn't seem to scare them at all. They seemed only mildly upset and kept arguing. To this day, I can only assume they just didn't believe us or something. Then we heard a neighboring home's door swing open and a very pissed off man's voice say, If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the police. For whatever reason, that's what caused them to freak out. And then they drove off. The police arrived and we told them the whole story. Natalie revealed that a couple of times, she had just barely peeked through the blinds of a window close to the front door, and then she noted that there were two guys, but only one of them was ever at the door at any given time. They would switch, with one at the door and the other sitting in the driver's seat of a car parked out front, presumably for getaway purposes. So yeah, that's reassuring. They also hadn't looked drunk, according to Natalie, and they definitely hadn't sounded like they were drunk. There wasn't much the police could do besides sweep the area a bit, but they told us that if the stranger showed up again, to immediately call instead of engaging with them at all. 
One of the officers did give us some self-defense tactics and told us what kind of household items and chemicals would work best for self-defense. After making sure everything was okay and reassuring us, they left. We eventually called Katie and told her the weirdos were gone. She came back home and was understandably a bit shaken herself. We sat down and asked her who might have known where she lived. She didn't know the people who had come to the apartment and even Natalie hadn't recognized the guys outside as any previous visitors. Worse, it turned out that not only did they know Katie's friend's name, but they claimed to know her boyfriend even though he didn't live in the state where we were going to school. She swore up and down that she didn't know anyone who would want to hurt her. By this point, it was around 5am, so I didn't even bother going to sleep. I had to be up for a workshop in the morning. I told a lot of my classmates the story, and it freaked them out too. And the entire day, Natalie and I jumped at every unexpected noise, every shadow, every random movement. That night it was so hard to sleep, I expected to hear a knock at the door at any second. Thankfully they didn't come back, ever, but that also makes things more unsettling, in a way. I'll never ever know what they wanted that night. Did they think we were hiding Katie? Was she seeing less than savory people in secret? Did they want to hurt her? If they did, why did they never give up and go looking for her elsewhere? Was all of this just an excuse to get into an apartment of young women? Did they want to kidnap us, hurt us, or rob us? Who knows? I try to not let it bother me, but I wish I knew my life wasn't in danger that night. I have the feeling it might have been. After all, they weren't wearing face coverings. So if they wanted to commit a violent crime, they might want to get rid of witnesses. It was the summer of 98. Hot California desert. I was five years old riding shotgun in my mom's crappy little convertible. It barely ran, but the seats were red velvet. The radio worked and being able to take the top down almost made up for the lack of air conditioning. My days were normally spent at daycare or the babysitters, as my single student mom put in long hours at her job to provide for us. I didn't mind, it just meant the days like today were even more special. My mom was driving me across to the next county to my cousin's house for a birthday party that was going to be complete with dress-up games and ice cream cake. To truly seal the deal, she had taken us to McDonald's right before we headed out on our drive. I got a Happy Meal with the stuffed Simba from The Lion King as my toy. Remember that for later. Our conversation eased on the way to the freeway, and for the most part, it was a pleasant and uneventful ride. I remember the loud noise of the cars and hot wind. I first became aware of the truck as it lays on its horn behind us. I turned in my seat to see a huge grey truck of a monster tailgating us ridiculously close. As soon as it was safe, my mom changes to the slow lane on the right of the freeway, assuming he will pass us. He pulls level to our car, rolls the windows down and begins screaming at us to pull over, in the middle of the desert, on the freeway. My mom ignores him and tells me to do the same. I remember feeling uneasy, but less scared than annoyed. Kind of like, dude, come on. This is my day to have fun. Leave us alone. Besides, I wasn't really a stranger to angry shouting men, even at that age. Unfortunate but true. I think the lack of reaction irritated the man, or maybe this was his plan the entire time. But he swiftly pulls into our lane and essentially forces us off the road onto the shoulder. My mom does her best to maintain control of the car and not make contact with the other vehicle, but that's pretty much impossible. The unmistakable crunch of metal rings out. Both vehicles come to a stop. Again, on the side of a desert freeway, there's not exactly anyone around to help out or places to go. My mom checks to see if I'm okay and remains in her seat. Now, if I were her, I don't know if I would have waited to confront this man with a child in my car after that stunt. However, my ma has and always will be. The tough as nails type of gal who isn't afraid of anything, especially when she feels she has been wronged. And of course she has no idea what was to happen next. 
legs. In a flash of anger and cursing, the man is at our driver's side door, screaming about the damage to his car and how it was caused by food trash that had been flying out of the convertible, landing on his front window and blocking the view. He starts demanding compensation, that my mom get out of the car and come and look at his. At this point, my mom refuses to get out of the car. She points at a call box a fair distance away and says it's best to call the cops and let them handle this. That's not the answer the angry man wanted. In one fluid movement, this man grabs the back of my mother's head and once, twice, three times smashes it into the steering wheel, leaving her unconscious. Lifting her like a sack of potatoes, he drops her on one side of the road and jumps into the driver's seat, keys still in the ignition. And then he starts the car. I haven't even reacted yet. I think I was in an absolute state of shock. It wasn't until I felt the car moving and going back on the road did I register what had happened. And when it hit me, it hit me hard. I went ballistic. I was no longer just annoyed with this man. I was now furious for what he did to my mom. I remember I held my stuffed Simba by the tail as I climbed out of my seat and began screaming while whipping the man in the face, trying to blind him. My battle cry was, You're the meanest man in the whole world. I clawed and kicked and gave no care what was going to happen to me, just that this man was going to pay. This led to a couple of things happening. First, I made it impossible to drive that car safely. He ended up crashing into another shoulder. Second, by this time, people had started seeing a combination of a woman lying on a shoulder and a convertible with the Tasmanian devil of a five-year-old beating up on some creeper and began to alert authorities. I don't remember too much after that. I remember the cops arriving and me sitting in the back of a police cruiser. They gave me a teddy bear and asked me a lot of questions. My grandma picked me up. My mother went to the hospital where she thankfully didn't have any major damage. It was just a busted nose and some whiplash. I never made it to my cousin's party and I never saw that white convertible again. I'll always be thankful for my main man Simba having my back through all of that. I don't know what that man's intentions were. Looking back and knowing the area we lived in, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if drugs played a major part in this. My brothers, partner, best friend and I all recently took a trip to Kansas City to go to the Orville Peck concert. We waited until sort of last minute to reserve an Airbnb because we weren't 100% sure who was all going. Nonetheless, we found one just out of Kansas City in a suburb called Grandview at a pretty reasonable rate. The host's overall rating was good and we didn't see anything out of the ordinary when reading the first few reviews, so we thought we'd gotten a pretty good deal. We arrived in Grandview a little after 3 p.m. Our Airbnb was on the bottom floor of the owner's home, and as we pulled up to the house, we noticed quite a bit of religious signs and statues on the lawn. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't have an issue with people believing in what they believe in, so as long as it doesn't infringe upon other people's rights. But here we were, a group of visibly queer folks about to attend a gay country concert, blindly walking into someone's home that we'd be staying in for the next two nights. We decided there was nothing to be worried about after that. After all, we technically were in the Bible Belt, so we shouldn't be surprised that we were staying in the home of someone who was religious. My brother and partner called the host and met her at the front door of our guest suite. She showed them around while the rest of us got our suitcases unloaded. When they came back to meet us, they said she was super nice, and again, our minds were eased. We decided to hang out, order food and rest a bit before we headed off to the concert. Our comfort did not last long though. While we were getting our suitcases unpacked and laying around in one of the bedrooms of our guest suite, my youngest brother was casually looking through the drawers of dressers and side tables, as anyone would do. Most of what we found was normal. Extra bed sheets, pens, paper, tablets. Nothing really out of the ordinary. That is until he came across something that would completely change our outlook on the trip. 
Inside the drawer was a Bible. It wasn't super weird considering where we were staying, but as he was flipping through the pages of it, a small tinfoil packet fell out. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about drugs or what they look like, what fell out of that Bible rhymes with smack star Sarawen. That's right. Not even 30 minutes into our stay, my youngest brother found hard drugs in the folds of a Bible. At this point, we weren't sure what to do. We didn't want to tell the hosts, and we certainly didn't want to call the cops. We contemplated taking the packet and throwing it away at some random gas station, but ultimately, we decided to put it back where we found it and act like none of us had seen it. We got food and started getting ready for the concert. While the rest of us got ready, my partner, who was not going to the concert, started reading through the household handbook. Everything seemed pretty standard except a few lines that read something like, We will respect your privacy so as long as you respect ours. We can be as available as you need us to be. And if you're interested in speaking about the ministries of God, feel free to reach out. Again, I have nothing against people following the religions that they do, but that seemed like an awfully out of place thing to put in your household rules handbook for your guest suite. There were a few other books around the guest suite that stuck out as a little off base with titles like Teaching Men to Comprehend How Women Think and How Women Should Think. We ignored these things for the most part, aside from my partner who was now freaked out about being left alone at the suite while the rest of us went off to our concert. I told him it was just some BS and that he really didn't have anything to worry about. He's a worry wart though, so as soon as we left, he locked himself in the bedroom and started looking a bit more into the books that we found. He came to the realization that the books were associated with a group called the International House of Prayer, a prominent religious cult found in Kansas City, a majority of whose members live in the Grandview suburb, where we were staying. I could write a whole separate post about the International House of Prayer's members, but essentially they're an evangelical Christian group that has a functioning 24-7 prayer room that has been going on non-stop since 1999. There is also a murder, ruled a suicide, cover-up case associated with the group. But again, it's all too much to talk about. We got back from the concert really late, so he didn't mention anything about it that night. But he was quick to tell us the next morning. At this point we thought, okay, these people are part of some weird church, whatever, it's fine. That had explained some of the weird rules and books we found. We left for the day to go hang around the city, and when we got back to rest, my friend and partner started doing some more reading on the group. That's when we found out that we were actually staying in one of the prominent leaders' houses. We figured this out by cross-referencing the names of our hosts with the names of the important members on the International House of Prayer's website. After this, we started to snoop a bit more into our suite. We found large barrels of dried food, a jug of some kind of liquid that we later found out is what they drink while they fast, and lots more of the International House of Prayer's teaching materials. Basically, it seemed like they were completely prepared for some sort of end of times rapture. Eventually, we did go back and read more thoroughly through the reviews, and we did find a review that would set off some sort of red flags. For example, one review stated how the male owner brought out a gun in front of people who were staying there. Yikes. Not to mention, if there was even a hint of a negative review left, the host would leave a snarky reply. Needless to say, we spent as much of our time as possible away from the Airbnb as we could for the remainder of our trip. And although we were never in any danger, we did feel very uncomfortable with the whole thing. I had just graduated high school and was a month and a half into summer break. Needing money for college, I began working full-time for the school district I had just graduated from. Due to a music festival I wanted to attend, as well as monetary concerns, I did not go with my family to North Carolina, which was fine by me. What 18-year-old doesn't want a house to themselves for a week? Furthermore, my parents' house is in the country so I had little to no fear about my neighbors complaining about parties or being bothered in any way whatsoever. 
But I was wrong. I often take the back roads home from my friend's house. But on that night, I decided I wanted some McDonald's. So I took the main drag and came home on a different route. This way takes you past a mechanic shop not a mile away from our cul-de-sac. It was between midnight and 1am, and as I passed the mechanic shop, I noticed a car's lights turning on. Or should I say light? This car had only one working headlight. I remember thinking that it was strange that this car all of a sudden turned its lights on as I was passing, and I began to become even more concerned when it pulled out behind me. But I tend to be paranoid by nature. Nothing serious. But I always question if the person behind me is following me, and whether they mean me harm. So I brushed this off as an unfortunate coincidence. But as I neared my street and the car was still tailing me, I started to become freaked out. I looked at my gas tank and my heart sunk as I saw it was on E. Either I pull on my street and go home, or I risk driving around and seeing if this guy follows. Yet that option had the risk of running my car out of gas and leaving me stranded on the road. I figured I'd rather take my chances on my own soil than on the side of some dark and lonely country back road. So I turned onto my street, only to have my heart sink when the one headlamp car makes a turn right behind me. At this point, I know I'm screwed. With nothing left to do, I begin pulling up my driveway, and to my utter horror, they begin following me up. Looking back, I should have called the cops, but there is no love loss between law enforcement and myself and at the time I was too caught up to even consider calling them. If my family would have been home, this never would have happened. I could have called my dad and he could have grabbed his gun, but he, along with the rest of my family, were gone, 12 hours away at the beach. So when they began to drive up my driveway after me, I stopped and put my car in reverse. They responded by reversing as well, yet they stopped at the bottom, effectively blocking my driveway. At this point I pulled forward again, only to have the same jig and dance happen. They followed, I reversed, and then they reversed and sat at the end, blocking my escape. I quickly pulled up and turned my car around to come at them head on. By this time they were halfway up my driveway, the furthest they had come up. Looking back, I was terrified, alone and angry. Who did this person think they were? With my brights on and shining right into their face, I opened my car door and got out. I pulled out my pocket knife and grasped it in my left hand, while I grabbed my hammer in my right. In some weird desperate mindset, I made the split decision to grab the hammer from the head with the handle sticking out. My hope is that it would be mistaken as a gun. I began yelling and pointing my hammer at the car, screaming at them to get out, and what did they want? All the while, I held my hammer as if it was a gun, and prayed they would fall for it. Whether they did or not, I cannot say. Part of me believes that they thought it was a gun, due to my brights being behind me, making my whole front side a shadow, yet they could have just not wanted a fight. Perhaps they thought I was a girl or was timid, and wouldn't react so aggressively and violently. Who knows, but it worked. They slowly backed out of my driveway and crept around the cul-de-sac. As they were leaving my street, I ran after them, hiding behind my neighbor's houses. And at every driveway, the car would slow down to a near stop, as if scoping out the houses. Thankfully, they didn't pull into any driveways, and they turned off my street altogether. After I was safely in my house, I ate my McDonald's by the front window, with all the lights turned off, waiting to see if they'd come creeping back. Thankfully, they didn't, but that night, I locked every door in the house, and I slept with a hammer, machete, and baseball bat next to me, with my pocket knife under my pillow. I know it was complete overkill, but I was terrified. Now I know where my dad keeps his gun, so if it ever happens again, I'll be better prepared. Let me start off by saying, I just moved across the country, and it wasn't like two states away from Cali to Colorado, no. I moved from Colorado to the deep, deep south. 
My husband and I drove 27 hours over the course of two days with a dog and cat and all my stuff because he just got back from deployment and I had to leave my parents' house in Colorado to come back to the duty station, but I digress. We had been driving about four hours at this point and stopped off right on the border of Kansas and Colorado at a Love's truck stop. We usually love to stop at Love's. They're clean and moderately friendly. You get the gist. I went in first. I went to the bathroom, bought some water for the dog, and my husband filled up the truck and then drove it to the rest area so he could go in, and then I could walk the dog. While I was inside, I noticed a kind of sketchy guy in the corner by the beverage coolers, and he had sunglasses on inside. He was facing into the biggest part of the gas station, where all the people are coming and going and browsing. He was about five foot eight with white hair that was very dirty, board shorts and a green t-shirt with earphones in his ears. So I went back out to the truck and switched with the husband, harnessed up the dog, grabbed my knife like the good military spouse I am, because women shouldn't be without protection, and went to walk my dog on the grass while talking to my mom on the phone. The sketchy guy comes out of the shop and starts walking around the cars in the gas port. A couple of men caught him looking in the windows of their cars and yelled, and then he'd skid off to the next car over and repeat. My husband happens to walk out of the stop with a couple of burgers, as this guy makes a beeline for our truck. His sunglasses weren't opaque, and I could see him staring at me as he got a bit closer. He got to about five feet from our tailgate before I dropped my phone and fingered my knife in my hoodie pocket. My husband was running at this point, and my dog lost her mind. Barking, growling, all of it. I went ahead and pulled the knife just as he got to the tailgate and asked him, Can I help you? This jerk stopped dead in his tracks, stared at me, and said, I'm not messing with that one. She has a knife. Like he was talking to somebody. His earphones were still in two. He turned on his heel and walked to the left of me, where the cars were. He mumbled to himself while he was in our general area and then went back to browsing the new cars that were in the gas port. It was probably the scariest experience of my life, and I've been shot at, been in burning buildings, been bitten by drug addicts on the van on the way to ER, but you won't catch me going anywhere by myself unless I have to lately. I'm a long haul trucker. I see and deal with a lot of weird and scary stuff. I was traveling up US 93 in Nevada, heading to Portland, Oregon for delivery. It was around 1.30 in the morning. I needed to stop and log my half hour break. I found a wide spot and pulled off, did my logs up and made myself a sandwich. While I was eating said sandwich, I noticed a vehicle pulling behind me. I didn't get too concerned about it, but I kept an eye on it while I ate. Then it got strange. I noticed a figure in the headlight of the vehicle approach the back driver's side of my trailer, stop, and it looked like he was rubbing the back side of my trailer with his hand. Suspicious, I got my pistol out of my lockbox back in my sleeper, cocked it and locked it. I put it in my waistband and proceeded to climb out of my rig. I walked about ten feet back, kept my hand on the butt of my pistol and I flicked on my flashlight and aimed it at the person. It was a weird looking fellow in a dirty whitish trench coat, long straggly hair, and bald on top. He was rubbing something on the side of my trailer. I hollered at him to stop what he was doing. He looked up at me and smirked, and without taking his gaze off of me, starts to walk towards me. I walk backwards to my door, keeping my hand on my pistol but not pulling it out. I didn't feel my life was in danger at the time, so I climbed into my rig and shut and locked the door. This man walks up to my door and looks up at me still with a smirk. This man is off his rocker. I'm thinking my half hour break is over and it's time to go. However, while I'm looking down at him, getting ready to turn the key, I feel my truck rock. I jump and look in my driver's side mirror. Nothing. I look over to check my passenger side mirror, and there, on my step, 
Faced pressed to my passenger side window is a freaky, perfect replica of an old witch, smiling and with rotten teeth, cocking her head left then right, fogging up my window. Needless to say, I about suck my seat up my ass, but that's not the end of it, no. This guy then jumps on my driver's sidestep and proceeds to start licking my window. Then the witch lady starts smacking my window with the palm of her hand over and over. The man starts to yell to me, Hey, hey boy, open up. Come on now, open up. We're friendly. What you got in this trailer of yours? Anything good? Open up, boy. Now I feel threatened. I pull out my pistol and the witch immediately disappears off my passenger side step. The man laughs, jumps up and down on my step, and then grins. He touches his finger to his nose, then jumps off my step. I fired my truck up and took off, and I never did see any headlights following me. Thank God. So, disturbing travelers, let's not meet again. My husband was a trucker with a cross-country firm at the time. His driving partner separated from his girlfriend, and according to my husband, he couldn't afford to get his own place. I did find that odd as he made as much money as my husband, who clearly could afford the roof over our head. I had a newborn and was off on maternity leave. So his buddy moves into our spare room and makes himself at home, and I do mean at home. He'd walk into the living room and change the channel while I was watching TV, or turn on the stereo, fry himself a steak as a midnight snack, or eat an entire box of donuts, and he thought nothing of it. He'd take a shower and drop his dirty clothes on the floor for me to pick up and wash, and he stared at me a lot. I found him creepy and inconsiderate, and I told my husband so. Finally, after a couple of months of arguing about our unwelcome charity case, I gave my husband the ultimatum it was him or me. That sparked a huge argument between the two of them, with his buddy accusing him of being pussy whipped and not standing up for his friends. That did it for my husband and he told him he needed to go. My husband drove him to a hotel and we thought that was the end of it. The next day we'd gone to get groceries as I'd stopped buying anything but essentials so my husband's buddy could need us out of house and home. Imagine our shock when we got home and his buddy walks out of the kitchen, wearing my husband's clothes and smoking his pipe. As you can imagine, shit hit the fan. I went straight to the kitchen and phoned the police. In those days, there was no 911, so it was taking a bit, and he heard me talking. He bolted out of the house and we never saw him again. He never turned up at work again either. We discovered that he had broken a basement window to get in, so we boarded up the basement and changed the locks. A week or so later, I decided to use my cash nest egg I had stashed in my underwear drawer. It was gone, and I realized several pairs of my underwear were gone as well. I considered phoning the police again at that point, but we decided we didn't want to remind him of our existence. We moved out shortly thereafter. I really hope that the next tenants never got any unexpected house guests. All growing up, my dad was a semi-truck driver. He drove full-time all over the country. We didn't get to see him very often, but he used to call home almost every night. And in the summers, my sisters and I got to travel with them for a week or two. We called it trucking. This story happened when I was really small, probably four or so, and I don't really remember it. I was trucking with my dad and he was experiencing some minor engine trouble. Before he was a truck driver, my dad was a mechanic, so he did most of his own truck repairs. He pulled over in a small truck stop to do some work on the truck. There was a tree next to the parking lot, so he sat me down underneath it with my doll, and he worked on the truck right next to me. 
It was really hot and he was laying underneath the hot truck and blacked out. Who knows how long he was out. He was having a heat stroke. When he finally came to, he had a splitting headache and then he looked over to the tree to check on me. I was still sitting there playing with my doll, but there was a guy creeping up behind me, reaching out to grab me. I don't know how, but with a little bit of energy my dad had left, he jumped out from under the truck and swinging whatever tool he had nearby. The guy ran off and my dad collapsed. A lady working inside the truck stop saw the whole thing and came running out. She got me and my dad inside and took care of me while he cooled down. I don't know what would have happened if my dad hadn't woke up when he did. First of all, I'd just like to say that I've met plenty of truckers in my life, and most of them have been pleasant, albeit a bit lonely. However, like any group of people, there are gross exceptions. A few months ago, I was driving back to school from visiting my parents. It's about a two-hour drive, so I usually keep myself entertained with music. I'm a 5'3", 21-year-old female driving my dad's little old pickup truck in the leftmost lane of a three-lane highway, dorking around the music on the radio. Suddenly, I notice a semi-truck going the exact same speed as me in the rightmost lane. Embarrassed for getting caught in dork mode, I stopped singing and dancing and tried to speed up so he couldn't see me anymore. He matched my speed, which ticked me off a bit, so I looked at the driver, and to my surprise, he was smiling and waving. Thrown off, I kind of chuckled and waved back. Big mistake. He moves over to the middle lane to be a bit closer to me, and now he won't stop smiling and waving. At first, I played nice, waving back a bit, because a semi-truck beats a tiny pickup truck any day, but I was mostly focusing on getting out of this guy's field of vision safely. I tried speeding up as fast as my truck would allow, which was about 90 miles per hour and slowing down as suddenly as I could without endangering anyone behind me. But he would just match my speed no matter what. If there was someone coming up in his lane, he'd move to the right at the last possible second and pass them before I could slow down and get behind them. He has a lot more practice with reckless maneuvering than I do, so he has me trapped and using other cars to help him. The whole time, he's smiling, waving, holding up his first finger for some reason I still don't know, and rapidly losing any charm he once had. As this continues for about five miles, I got worried and called 911. I gave them a description of the truck and driver. They then advised me to pull off into the emergency shoulder on the left, but I've never done that. It looked so narrow, so I didn't feel comfortable doing that. At this point, he was passing someone else in the middle lane, I finally had the chance to slow down and merge two lanes over to the rightmost lane. I started speeding past him so he couldn't trap me again. The operator told me to take the closest service plaza about five miles away. She said he probably wouldn't follow me, so I could stop there for a few minutes before getting back on the highway. She told me to call if he did follow again, but he probably wouldn't, so she hung up. Now he's still holding up the number one sign with his first finger and smiling in this creepy, increasingly perverted grin at me while I avoided eye contact. The service plaza is in a quarter mile, and I'm not using any turn signals, but I guess he knew what I was doing because he braked hard and merged right behind me at the last second to join me in exiting the service plaza. After I get my heart to start back up from the coronary I just experienced, I called 911 again. Now the way this service plaza was set up, was that semi-trucks had to use a separate lane, winding to the right of the plaza, and that led to a parking lot behind the plaza just for big trucks. The rest of us used a smaller lane to park immediately in front of the plaza. I parked, and as I'm explaining to the new operator what's going on, I watch this semi creep around its path while the driver stares me down, smiling. I thought maybe I could have floored it to get back on the highway, but I was afraid he would see me and follow me again. So I drove to a gas station to the left of the plaza, which has a view of the semi-truck parking lot, hoping he wouldn't find me until the police came. 
The operator transfers me to the woman who was helping me before. She informs me that they've dispatched a couple of police cars, but couldn't tell me how long they'd be. I see the trucker has gotten out of his truck and is heading towards me, even though my windows are closed and my doors are locked. I'm panicking on the phone to the operator. She tells me the police should be there soon and I should be safe there, so I should sit tight while I keep her updated. I wanted to at least drive back to the parking lot I was in before, but it's a one-way entrance to the gas station so I couldn't. I glared at the trucker and showed him my phone when he came close. He finally stopped smiling and made it look like he was going into the service plaza. I looked in my right side view mirror and found him standing behind a big white pillar in front of the plaza, staring at me. Again, I freaked out and asked the operator where the cops were and if I could leave because he's being really creepy. She tells me to sit tight again because they should be there any minute, so I do. Then, he comes out of hiding and starts walking towards my truck. I put it in drive, just in case, and I tell the operator what he's doing. I refuse to make eye contact with him, but I keep watching my mirrors to make sure I know where he is. The smile is back, and he starts walking circles around my truck, looking at it as if looking for a way to get in. I couldn't take it anymore. I waited until he circled back behind me, floored it and told the operator I'm not waiting one more second for the police. She apologized and told me the police would look for the man and talk to him if they found him. She said I should focus on getting home safely while keeping an eye out for him. I don't know if they caught him or not, but I know none of that would have happened if I had my boyfriend with me. So, not only can I not walk alone, but I also can't drive alone as a female. Nice to know. For clarification, I'm a male and this happened in my early 20s. Before I start, I need to provide a little background. I grew up in a very sheltered life, usually only leaving the house for grocery runs and doctor's appointments. I didn't even go to school. My mother decided it was best to homeschool me. I was, and still am, very socially awkward as a result of my upbringing. Although, I am getting better. One thing I did leave the house for as a child was to compete in talent competitions. I was a pianist, I still am, though I am a bit rusty. I had a newspaper article published for me once to advertise a fundraising concert I was holding at my local church. I needed funds to go to a competition 1,500 miles away. In the article, the journalist recorded a quote from me. She had asked what I thought of my talent, and being a child in a Christian house, I replied, it's not my talent. God let me borrow it. Fast forward till I became an adult. I was eager to leave the house and to get out on my own. I decided to get my commercial driver's license so I could get out and see as much of the world as I could. Besides driving long hours and the occasional night of having trouble finding a halfway decent place to park at the end of the day, I enjoyed it. One night, I was pulling into a truck stop to park for the night. As I was taking my dog out to do his business, I passed by the truck next to mine. It had its driver's side window down and the driver was sitting in the driver's seat. He called out to me as I passed him, complimenting that he liked my dog, and then asked if he was friendly. I thanked him and informed him that my dog was shy of strangers. Being that I sat in a truck all day with no human interaction, besides the occasional honk and a guy flipping me off for being slow, I longed for conversation. I told him I would be right back. A few minutes later, after putting my dog in my truck, I walked over to talk to my parking spot neighbor. We talked for a while, him in his chair and I standing on the top step of the side of his truck. After about 20 minutes, he asked me if I noticed that his arm had bumped mine seven times. This surprised me. I had not noticed it at all. Thinking back on it, I believe he was testing to see how situationally aware I was. I told him I had not noticed. It was cold outside considering it was the middle of winter, so he invited me to sit in his truck and continue our conversation. This is where alarm bells should have been ringing in my head, but growing up so sheltered, I was too trusting of people. I entered. 
We continued to talk, though the conversation started crossing lines. He was asking questions that were too personal. Things like, what's your phone number? Who are your parents? What was your grandparents' full names? Where do you live? That kind of thing. Regretfully, I answered him. We had also swapped seats during the conversation. First, he had moved to the passenger seat so I could sit in the driver's seat. But then we swapped to where I was in the passenger seat and he was in the driver's seat. The conversation started to take a weird and creepy turn. After all those questions, he asked, Did you notice that my eyes don't have any color? His irises were black, just two black orbs surrounded by the whites of his eyes. This is where I started to feel very uneasy. He started talking about my childhood, and this is where he said something that disturbed me the most. He asked me, didn't you have a talent as a kid? I said yes, and that I played the piano. He replied, wouldn't that be a lie since you only borrowed it? I had not mentioned anything to him about that article, and the city he was from is too small to be noticed by someone that lives so far away. I was ready to get out of there. I was trying to think of how I could excuse myself without rousing suspicion. He started trying to convince me to ride with him to his next delivery and to just leave my truck where it was, that he would bring me back the next day. I declined. He then asked if I would come visit him at his home. Again, I declined. It had been several hours, so I decided to tell him I needed to take my dog out to do his business again, so he didn't go in my truck. I left his truck and took my dog out again, but this time when my dog was done, I went back in my truck and locked the doors. I also tilted both seats forward so it would be difficult if he entered my truck, buying me time if I needed it. The next morning he was gone. I continued on my day relieved that I was away from him. A few hours later he called me. So why did you tilt your seats forward last night? I told him it was to keep my dog from jumping on them. He continued to talk to me, though I kept my answers short this time. I blocked his number after he hung up, and later decided to change my phone number. I know I was lucky that it didn't go farther than a creepy conversation. I am more careful now about who I talk to and where I am. Be careful everyone. Never get into a stranger's vehicle, no matter how friendly and innocent they seem. I've learned my lesson. I was a 19-year-old new mom at the time this happened. My husband, now ex, came home from work with my 17-year-old brother in tow some time after 1am. They wanted to go out and get something to eat, and as I hadn't really left the house in months, I jumped at the opportunity. I grabbed the baby and put him in his car seat in the rear passenger seat. I called shotgun. My husband drove and my brother crawled into the back with the baby. We live in a small town, so nothing is open this late within the town limits. So our only option was to go a few miles out of town to a nearby truck stop. Now, the building itself is pretty small, but the lot is huge. There are quite a few 18-wheelers lined up on the far side of the lot, and a few cars parked in front of the building. There are some street lamps in the lot, but they are far and few between, so the lot is mostly dark. We parked in one of the dark spots at the side of the building, closest to the Hardy's entrance. The baby had fallen asleep by then, so I told my brother and husband to go on in and order for me. They do, and I immediately locked the doors as my mother had drilled into me since I was little. I am so thankful now that she did. My husband and brother had been gone for about five minutes. I was just staring straight ahead and listening to music when I catch movement out of the corner of my eye. I turn my head and see a man walking in my direction. He was probably mid-thirties with a mop of curly brown hair poking out from underneath a red baseball cap. I figured he was going towards the entrance to the restaurant as it was at most twenty feet away from me. And then I went back to spacing out. A couple of minutes pass and I hear a car door handle jiggle. I whip my head around and see the man pulling at the car door behind me at my baby's door. 
He gives up and takes two steps to my door. I quickly double and triple check all the doors are locked. They are. He tries my door and fails. And then he walks to the other side of the car and tries those doors too. I'm freaking out and frozen in fear. This is the age of the flip phone, so not everyone had a cell phone at this time. And I definitely didn't have one. He circles around the car two more times, checking each handle as he goes. I'm watching him this whole time in the mirrors, and he doesn't look directly at me once. I place my hand on the horn. I made the decision to really lay into it if he pulls a weapon or tries anything else. I take a moment to try and get a look into the store at my brother and husband, through the partially obscured windows and glass door, but I can't see them. I look in the mirrors to see the creeper's whereabouts but he's gone. I turn around in my seat and still can't see him. He must have given up and left. I relax a bit, but stay vigilant. Finally, my brother and husband exit the restaurant, food in hand. I cannot explain the relief that washed over me. I unlock the doors for them and they get in. My brother then asked, what was that guy doing crouched behind the car? My pulse quickened. Seriously? He's still there. My brother pointed to one of the cars in front of the building and said, No, when we walked to the car, he jumped up and ran over to that car there. He's lying flat in the back seat. To this day, I don't know if he was after me, the baby, or the car. Whatever it was, he was up to no good. I can only hope he never got the opportunity to hurt anyone. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed that one. I want to give a shout out to my patrons for supporting the channel. So huge thanks to Astara Rain, Rudy, Rochelle, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire05, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelays, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. And with that, I'll see you guys on the next one.